Uh, dear friends and colleagues, uh, welcome to the new edition uh, of uh, our uh, webinar uh, series. Uh, and uh, today uh, we focus uh, on proper use of English uh, for uh, scientific uh, writing uh, because uh, advanced uh, English uh, skills uh, are uh, necessary uh, for all uh, researchers uh, to um, process um, bibliographic uh, data, uh, health information, uh, and uh, for um, publication of uh, really influential uh, articles. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, we hope that uh, today's um, um, that knowledge gained uh, during today's uh, meetings uh, will uh, transform uh, into advanced uh, academic activities, uh, great uh, articles, uh, and uh, I am uh, very uh, happy uh, to uh, introduce uh, our today's uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Uh, Arman, uh, Dr. Latika, uh, Dr. Durga, uh, Vitalina Tishenko. <laughs> Hello and Happy New Year uh, to all our speakers and our participants. Uh, and uh, I uh, would like to say that Dr. Arman, uh, Dr. Latika and Dr. Durga are regular contributors uh, to our webinar uh, series. Uh, all of them are highly skilled um, journal uh, editors and authors of numerous uh, articles uh, published uh, in uh, English uh, in index medical uh, journals. Uh, and uh, um, our uh, new member of our team, Vitalina Tishenko, is also a highly skilled uh, linguist, uh, translator uh, and uh, editor uh, of uh, Krivy Rik National University uh, Journals. Uh, welcome, uh, Vitalina, uh, to our team. <laughs> I am very happy to see you <laughs> and you, Latika, Arman, and Durga. And now I am going uh, to switch uh, from uh, English to Ukrainian. Дорогі друзі, колеги, вітаю вас з Новим Роком і з прийдешнім Різдвом Христовим. І хочу сказати для наших нових учасників, що минулий рік для нас був надзвичайно продуктивним. Він розпочався у лютому місяці з зустрічі у Львові, яка була організована Львівським національним медичним університетом Данила Галицького. А потім були проведені 12 вебінарів. Власне, через ці нові умови, в яких ми всі опинилися, через неможливість проведення очних зустрічей. І протягом всіх цих вебінарів ми розглядали дуже важливі питання для кожного науковця, а саме методологію проведення наукових досліджень, особливо в сучасних умовах, так? а також розглядали міжнародні стандарти публікації наукових статей і розглянули всі питання, починаючи від етичного автору, так, до міжнародних стандартів, так, як оформити наукову статтю. Обговорювали питання про хижацькі журнали, про неетичні агенції, які, на жаль, процвітають в Україні. І от щойно, буквально 15 хвилин назад, я додалася в таку таємну вайбер-групу, так, яка, власне, займається тим, що продає авторство так, в наукових статтях. І от, зокрема, наприклад, таке оголошення. Шановні колеги, швидкі публікації у Скопусі. Публікація планується в кінці січня 2021 року. Тема суто медична. Сучасні методи лікування кропив'янки, що часто рецидивує. Тобто можна, навіть не будучи фахівцем так, в кропив'янці, або навіть не лікарем, а іншим спеціалістом, купити собі авторство так, і стати автором статті, яка буде опублікована в журналі, що індексується в Скопусі. І тому, власне, я вам всім бажаю, щоб ви ніколи не стали таким автором. Так? От, і, власне, основна мета наша – це скажімо так, здобути нові знання так, і покращити рівень англійської мови, який дуже необхідний не тільки для того, щоб провести належним чином наукове дослідження, але й для того, щоб на гарній англійській мові опублікувати вашу статтю з результатами вашої наукової роботи у хорошому англомовному науковому журналі. Отже, розпочинаємо наш вебінар. Наш перший спікер, так, доктор Арман Гаспарян. Please welcome, доктор Арман. 
Доктор Армен вивчає українську мову, так? хоч у нас сьогодні англомовний так, день, але ще трішки він також заговорить і українською мовою. А, також хочу сказати, що всі наші вебінари з попереднього року були записані, так, і всі наші учасники сьогоднішні також можуть ознайомитися з ними на нашому YouTube-каналі, вони всі є у вільному доступі. Так, хто не встиг до нас приєднатися минулого року, прошу підписатися на YouTube-канал і подивитися записані відео. Сьогоднішній вебінар також буде записаний, і ви зможете його неодноразово дивитися скільки завгодно раз. So, Olena, thank you very much for your introduction and uh, New Year wishes. So I'm happy to see uh, a number of participants from different Ukrainian cities and also uh, one participant from Bulgaria. So we are going to discuss an important issue uh, related to scholarly writing and uh, journal editing. And I hope that uh, today's webinar, the whole webinar, will be instrumental for improving quality of writing and quality of editing local journals. Uh, some of these points will be useful to those uh, who wish to write art English articles without refer referring to commercial editing services, uh, editing agencies. So our main aim to help our participants to start writing their articles in English and uh, targeting good journals. So I'm going to start my presentation with referring to uh, hematologist and endocrinologist, British uh, physician who practiced uh, um, in uh, uh, more than uh, 70 years ago and he is considered as one of the uh, etymologists, etymologists who uh, investig examined the meaning of words in medicine, medical terminology. And he was also a doctor who uh, proposed uh, new terms, several terms, several diseases. He even described several diseases and syndromes like Munhausen syndrome or uh, myxedema madness. So this um, guy, Richard Asher, uh, wrote in his uh, uh, quite influential uh, seminal article, which was published in British Medical Journal back in 1958. Uh, the opinion piece was about dullness of medical journals, uh, which uh, publish a lot without considering author's satisfaction, without paying attention to attractiveness of articles. And he also mentioned that it's a tedious duty for uh, thesis, thesis writers to publish in uh, good journals. And he also uh, considered it's uh, an uphill task for medical, for doctors to write articles in English and publish in good journals. In his uh, lifetime, the best journals for medics were British Medical Journal, BMJ, Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine. And of course, this uh, one of the best medical authors, medical writers. Uh, he opened an avenue for medical writers uh, who followed him. And for me, he is also an exemplary, uh, an exemplary author. So hope you will learn a lot by uh, reading some of his seminal works. So articles should be attractive, should be uh, grammatically correct. And we discussed a lot about graphics, uh, figure drawing. Uh, we also discussed social media attention, 
attention to articles cita importance of citations. But today we are going to discuss language issues and I'd like to introduce some of the influential linguistic journals. Some of our participants, researchers may also find these journals also uh, interesting and important. Uh, we know that um, uh, there are more than 800 linguistic journals indexed by Scopus database and uh, listed on Saimago journal and country rank. All specialists may benefit from this list, Saimago journal and country rank, and they all specialists should know uh, top journals in their field of interest. Let's say in, in the field of linguistics, we have eight, more than 800 uh, journals. And first quarter of these journals, 200 journals are considered as top linguistic journals, but only three listed journals are presented here, like Journal of English for Scientific Purposes and others are uh, uh, regularly publish articles of interest to non-anglophone authors or editors who may learn how to improve their writing and editing skills. Uh, in uh, Ukraine, there are only two index journals with citation metrics. Uh, both relate to uh, psycholinguistics and their citation uh, uh, metrics are not so impressive. Hopefully these journals will improve uh, and uh, there will be more English, uh, more linguistic journals from Eastern Europe, from uh, Ukraine, listed by Saimago Journal and Country Rank. For me and for uh, most medical authors, there are some exemplary journals essential for improving writing skills. And I hope that uh, your uh, English instructs, in, instructors uh, at your universities will also um, ask your medical students or medical doctors to read more articles from these uh, journals where all articles are in uh, polished English. And um, these uh, journals may also be used by your English instructors, English language instructors, to uh, arrange journal club meetings, to discuss research methodologies, uh, research mistakes, but also learn some uh, tricks how to properly structure English sentences or English paragraphs and larger passages of text. For me, nature is uh, daily reading. So nature is a top scientific journal. Lancet is top medical journal, New England Journal of Medicine as well. And I learned also from my mentors, English uh, mentors, particularly one of the influential mentors in science editing was, uh, and she is now, uh, one of the uh, editors of Lancet, she also uh, suggested to regularly read the Economist journal to improve writing skills and to act uh, to, to be uh, more advanced science editor. So all our researchers at some point may also become science editors. But for those who are going to uh, contribute to medical journals, I strongly suggest to read, to follow medical writing journal. Journal is indexed by Scopus and um, it's a subscription journal, but some of articles are free, uh, freely available, openly available. So you can read these uh, uh, articles, articles from these journals uh, and improve your writing skills. Uh, as uh, some, as a non-anglophone uh, author and editor myself, I also uh, share my experience with you, with non-anglophone authors and ask you 
to uh, listen uh, BBC Radio 4. It may help improve your listening skills, but also we know that uh, our writing skills also depend uh, dependent on our reading and listening skills. So it's helpful for those who are going to uh, teach from prefer Ukrainian or Eastern European medical universities. So these are just tricks and uh, writers, journal editors, and also probably English instructors. So uh, to discuss uh, editing and writing issues, I uh, also would like to recall help support from my uh, colleague and also journal editor, chief editor of jo uh, Journal of Korean Medical Science, uh, member of International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, who mentioned in one of his uh, quite influential articles that uh, those who are going to write articles should uh, understand, should learn from others and should uh, uh, understand some of the basic principles. He divided uh, these basic principles of writing into 10 points, 10 tips to uh, novice authors and novice science editors. So first of all, we often uh, ask our uh, authors to be consistent in their writings and to have logical flow in their articles. So logical flow dependent on depends on um, keywords. Keywords are essential for uh, tagging your articles, article title, abstract, main text. Uh, so you should know about specific uh, keywords re related to your field of interest. Let's say for medics, these keywords come from medical subject headings. For geologists, uh, keywords come from uh, American uh, Society of Geology. They also have their vocabulary of professional terms. So, so these terms are important for properly tagging your text and to have a flow, professional flow or logical flow. Each scientific article should be a story, a story uh, uh, that uh, con uh, contains attractive messages, uh, attractive images, graphics. So all uh, contents in uh, within one article, one manuscript should be uh, related, should be properly interpreted and should be attractive. Without uh, this attractiveness, difficult uh, to um, increase readability of your article. So and you are not going to impress as, as authors, you are not going to impress uh, by uh, sophisticated terms, by, uh, diff uh, by uh, using difficult, different term tenses uh, or sophisticated passages. All sentences should be simple and sometimes also simplistic, simplistic if you are going to present a difficult methodology. And all texts should be clearly understandable for non-experts. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Sung Tae Hong, author of these 10 tips for authors, he uh, suggested to read Science, Nature, Cell, and Lancet. So our messages overlap. So I also follow his steps, uh, Professor Hong's steps, and I also uh, propose top scientific journals as the best readings to improve your writing skills, uh, uh, regardless of your level of proficiency. Even advanced uh, English speaking authors need to regularly 
update, upgrade their writing skills. And for that, they also need to read top scientific journals. Uh, uh, Professor Hong suggested to uh, always have uh, links, connection between first and last sentence in a para paragraph, uh, a large chunk of text. So it's golden rule for all uh, from journal editors. So beginning and end of your paragraph and beginning and end of your manuscripts should be connected, somehow connected. Main messages, main keywords, and if you have a question in the beginning, you should have an answer somewhere in conclusion or in last paragraph of your text. And of course, he also suggested to use connecting keywords or words, logical words. If in your, uh, let's say, uh, it's emerging uh, academic discipline and there are no uh, structured vocabularies, you should use logical words and you should tag your article by logical uh, professional words. So some golden rules from me. Uh, I usually stick to rule three. So always try to have uh, less than three examples in an article and always try to use Oxford comma linguists know how to use this Oxford comma. So always try to uh, write short sentences, uh, use no more than three examples. If you have uh, um, numerous examples or numerous scientific facts, always try to stick to rule three. Always uh, pr uh, present, discuss no more than three examples. Uh, when you write articles, uh, you should stick to either British or American English styles. And as editor, I, when I see mixture of styles, I always suspect plagiarism, copying, because uh, naive um, authors always copy from different sources and they uh, do not pay attention to styles. So you should know the difference between American and English style. And you should also edit your article uh, using these styles to properly use, uh, to properly edit uh, medical terms, uh, English and uh, British and American terms, etc. So, and of course, uh, golden rule for me also to have logical connection between initial and final parts in your paragraph, uh, large passage of text and also uh, main, uh, your manuscript. We should also use proper pro, uh, tenses properly. Vo the same refers to voices. So uh, you probably know from your English instructor in instructors a lot about tenses. Uh, the, in writing, in medical writing particularly, we stick to a few tenses. And simple present tense is commonly uh, used in medical texts, medical manuscripts. Uh, simple, uh, we may also use simple past tense uh, without playing with perfect tenses. It may complicate me, may make our uh, text sophisticated and poorly readable, poorly understandable, particularly to non-anglophone readers. So we usually speak to simple tenses, simple present tense, simple past tense. And some of the uh, parts of manuscripts, let's say uh, results section usually likes Pa simple past tense. Uh, 
Simple present tense is usually used for describing common knowledge, something that is uh, widely known. So there is no need to play with tenses when you describe common knowledge. And try to avoid perfect continuous tenses. Probably, again, you overly use pre uh, in your spoken language, but for writing, try to avoid continuous tenses and use active voice. Is prefer active voice instead of passive voice. So instead of uh, the results were collect, collected, were, were uh, presented, which is passive voice use, the results are uh, 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 we uh, we uh, I'll uh, this uh, present uh, active voice a bit later. So, but here as example results um, we present result and passive voice, and active voice is preferred. So I refer to uh, uh, knowledge and experience of my non-anglophone editors from Slavonic journal. Um, it's a Serbian journal and they clearly presented their recommendations how to use tenses. Let's say uh, introduction uh, should use present simple present tense, whereas uh, the same with discussion, whereas results, method section, and sometimes also abstract uh, use like past, simple past tense. We try to uh, cut redundant phrases. Some of these phrases are considered uh, are hedges. So uh, when we are hesitant, when we, uh, would wish to sound more polite, we may use, or uh, when we wish to express our emotions, we may use hedges, our, um, express our emotions. But in medical writing, particularly in medical writing, we should use strict language and we should cut all unnecessary or uh, redundant phrases. Let's say, it was noting redundant phrase. It has been shown that uh, you see perfect tense, present perfect tense, not useful in medical writings. It is well known that instead of uh, using this phrase, you cut this phrase and strictly go to, to the point. And the last example is H to the best of our knowledge, so emotional emotional phrase, again, not always welcome by editors, by uh, language editors. Uh, we should also cut redundant words and we should know which words are redundant, useless. So in medical texts, no need to use really. It's used uh, frequently in spoken language, but really, rarely used in uh, medical texts. Ne uh, re th uh, then mm, that is used, but American editors prefer to cut these, they often consider that also as a redundant word you may see. And we will discuss that as a, mm, a connecting word uh, a bit later. So very, no need to use very, non-anglophone uh, authors often use very, very rare case report. All case reports are rare. There is no need to emphasize that case reports, our case report is very rare or quite rare. Quite is also uh, a redundant word in medical texts. There are also other redundant words world uh, words kind of almost somewhat uh, when uh, 
uh, you see some examples of cutting redundant words instead of using uh, phrase or uh, word wary, very scared. It's uh, more logical to use terrified or petrified. So use uh, synonyms you should know as a intermediate and or advanced authors, you should know how to properly use synonyms. A very unique, rare case, use simply case of something. Quite helpful. Instead of that, use just helpful. Helpful knowledge, helpful methods, etc. Not quite helpful. Quite is spoken word and redundant word in medical texts. All patients received. If all patients received received uh, tr drug treatment, you can cut all and simply go to the straight to the point. Patients received treatment, or the patients received treatment. Uh, again, I refer to uh, experience of uh, Slavic editors. Uh, they also are well aware of verbose, verbosity of texts, Slavic texts, or translated into, in, in English. So you may also uh, encounter verbose sentences, verbose texts, and you will have to cut all these uh, unnecessary words, logically useless sentences. So always try to cut editors often cut texts. So here is first example. It is reported by C Smith that, so you see that is a redundant word and it is reported also redundant phrase, simply uh, edited uh, sentence sounds like Smith reported something. We are in an opinion that we simply agree instead of that, Etc. Etc. So you see also here because I also often use because, and often try to replace uh, verbos phrases like as a conse consequence of. It's, uh, we will see other examples as well. I simply replace by one word because. You see long verbos uh, passage. As far as our observations are concerned, they show simply we observed, etc. Try to use synonyms. Why we need synonyms? Because synonyms enrich our texts. And when uh, we may also avoid uh, so called tautology, tautology, so repetition, when you uh, repeat, repetitively use the same terms, the same uh, words. Instead of that, you can simply go to Google, find out synonyms and use. It's uh, quite helpful tactics. So I can use quite here because uh, just to emphasize that we need to work with synonyms. Uh, we may also enrich our texts or uh, use proper terms to describe scientific facts. Let's say evaluate has several synonyms, examine, assess, explore, etc. Uh, we often, in my experience as well, uh, particularly non-anglophone authors use nice too often, nice cartoons, nice figures. Instead, you can use amusing cartoons, uh, funny cartoons or uh, funny jokes, not just nice jokes. So you may enrich your text. And if you see several passages containing the same nice, the same word nice, you will have to again replace with synonyms. Uh, we may also use adjectives uh, it's often practice to describe scientific facts. So, and you should know when to use few, little or scarce. So uh, just to know about that few or even less scarce. Uh, 
uh, handful, uh, another synonym for this adjective. May, you may also use some, several, numerous, a lot of. So again, you should operate with different words. And science editors should also help to improve, to polish your text by using different proper terms. Instead of some, you may use several. And if you have a number of uh, scientific facts or things, simply you, may, uh, you write numerous, numerous. Uh, much or many, when to use much or many. Of course, you should know about countable and uncountable nouns and much money, not met many money. So these type of things. So uh, we are going to discuss adjectives, probably something different for uh, non-experts, uh, compound adjectives. We use as medical authors, uh, these compound adjectives frequently without understanding their meaning and how to edit these adjectives. Uh, adjectives are two or more defining words connected by hyphen. Uh, these are often placed before nouns. So here are examples. A highly cited paper a well-known professor, a two-year-old patient. These are common examples from our writings, medical writings. And you see that we may also use these compound adjectives differently, Post, uh, placing them after nouns. Noun is here, paper, professor, patient. And you see different uh, exam different examples. A paper is highly cited. So we lost compound adjective. Instead, um, and we can no longer use hyphen for highly cited. Or a patient is, is 20, for, uh, 20 years old. You see difference between a 20 year old patient and a patient is 20 years old without hyphens. So these are common examples. Please think about these examples when you edit medical texts, case reports particularly. There are also compound subjects, not adjectives, subjects, uh, most commonly nouns or uh, combination of nouns. So two or more individual nouns or noun phrases for, um, that form a singular thing or singular unit are considered as compound subjects. Uh, individual subjects connected by, in other words, these are individual subjects connected by and or connecting words. Uh, these are seemingly plural words or phrases but connected with singular verb. So we should, in our sentences, we should have agreement between subject and verb or compound subject and verb. And whether verb is singular or plural, it's, uh, it's quite important. Examples are here. The doc doctor and nurse are on duty today, simple. There are no compound subjects, individual subjects, but the manufacturer and promoter of vaccines is the same organi organization. You see difference here? The manufacturer and promoter of vaccine, compound subject and connected with uh, singular verb is. The survey data, data is connected, collected by a single researcher. So you see compound subject, data, data, it sounds like plural, but it refers to a merged or closely connected group of things, data. But another example, the survey data are heterogeneous. So you see difference data here in survey and data 
singular and plural. The number of patients is too small. The number of patients, we, it's not compound uh, subject, but we also frequently uh, hesitate to use proper singular or plural uh, verb, is or were. A number of patients were treated or numerous patients were treated. I've used here synonym, uh, a number and numerous. During and while also common uh, um, thing to know in medical writing. During is a preposition and it always, it is always followed by noun. While is conjunction word and it's always followed by a subject and verb. So examples. Students were active during the lecture, nor, but not while the lecture. While is a process, whereas du, uh, denotes process, while during denotes period of time. Students were active while taking part or watching the lecture process. You see difference. Often uh, non-anglophone authors uh, struggle to distinguish these words among or between. Between is used with two uh, things, two nouns, between a patient and a control, whereas among is used when we have a number of things or nouns, a number of subjects, more than two subjects, among healthy controls, but not between healthy controls, which or that. Uh, as a connecting words. We may use, we should use these uh, words to, uh, when we have clauses, either def uh, defining or non-defining. So you should know about difference between defining and non-defining clauses. Clauses are phrases with verb. So I'll uh, present some examples and it, it will be much clear, but for now just Remember that which is used in non-defining clauses, that in defining clauses, that to denote some, something specific. And if the clause omission uh, do not affect the meaning of your sentence, so uh, you can use which. And in that, when you use which, sometimes you also should use uh, commas. To separate to separate uh, these clauses from the rest of uh, sentence from the rest of the sentence. Examples: bibliographic databases, which are frequently listed in search strategies of reviews, are helpful. So, if we uh, omit or cut this. Uh, non-defining uh, clause, we uh, may still have a logical sentence. So this is why we use uh, commas to separate this part, this clause. And you see, we may read this the same sentence without uh, damaging meaning. Bibliographic databases are helpful for something. So this is why we use which, which is more preferable than that in this particular case. So now another example that when we use that, we specify, we define something and there is no need to use commas and we cannot cut this defining or specific passage with a specific clause. So Scopus, that is the largest database, is now integrated. So we uh, here we may use which and uh, that, uh, but that is more preferable because Scopus that, not which. We specify Scopus that. But, uh, another example, vaccines that contain inactivated viruses are safer than something else. So 
if we cut this information, this part is closed, it will be senseless. Virus uh, vaccines are safer. Which vaccines? That vaccines and vaccines probably related to COVID-19. So who, that, and which? When we use who, usually with people, that sometimes with people, but often with things, and which with things. So examples, just to, uh, uh, um, to understand more, uh, to better understand, the patients with disabilities who are treated in the hospital often from uh, form clinical trial arms. The patients who, people who, the ward, the hospital ward that is occupied by patients may be renovated. So that refers to thing or, uh, but not here, not people think. The drugs, again, uh, we, we use which, which drugs were uh, purchased, were expensive. So you see, we cannot use here who, uh, uh, we cannot use here that, we use simply which to non-specific uh, word. Because as and since also commonly uh, used in medical writing. Uh, these are conjunctions that introduce subordinate clauses because is more commonly, more commonly used compared to us and since. Uh, Indian authors, medical authors often use us and they probably know uh, the difference between us, since, and because. Use because to focus on reason. Use as and since to focus on result. Use comma when the subordinate clause comes before the main clause. Again, I'll show some examples. Because, is a, because of is a two word preposition. You see difference between co conjunction and preposition and it's uh, often used with noun. You see difference because of uh, something or because that something is used. So because or because of. Examples, because it was penetrating, we cannot use because of it. Because of the penetration through, you see difference between these two prepositions. So, and here example of uh, all parts of the sentence read well. Uh, and there is no need to edit. So we may use here as, as all parts of sentence read well. So you see, this is a subordinate clause. Non-anglophone authors often uh, use subordinate or not important uh, passages in the beginning of the of their sentences, but it's preferable to use subordinate clauses or non-important clauses at the end after the main information. So I would prefer to use there is no need to edit as and as all parts of the sentence read well. So because may uh, may be also used to replace redundant or hedge phrases, hedges. So because often replaces due to the fact that, owing to the fact that, in view of the fact that, so all these uh, redundant or verbose phrases can be easily replaced by because. So uh, we uh, talking about uh, agreements between different parts in a, in a sentence or in a paragraph, we should know a linguistic term uh, called parallelism. And again, not all uh, medics are familiar with parallelism. Parallelism is a construction 
uh, a balanced or matched construction with within one or more sentences uh, to form grammatically correct and well-balanced or matched structure. When we edit text, medical text, we often should remember about parallelism or balances within text, within uh, sentence and within paragraph. Why? So if we use one sen uh, tense, let's say one tense in one sentence and another tense in, uh, in the followed sentence, it's unbalanced, unmatched text. So we should try to use the same tense. Or if we use words, singular words, we should try to uh, use again singular examples. Or if we use plural examples, all examples should be matched, should be the same plural examples. It's called parallelism. So examples of uh, matched and mismatched parts. You see, first example, practicing competing to win. Mismatched example. So we should try to uh, match these parts in a sentence, these words in a sentence. Practicing, competing, and winning. So we use gerund form of verbs. Practicing, pr competing, or win winning. We may also edit the other way around. Instead of gerund verbs, again, uh, in medical texts, uh, sometimes it's better to use uh, infinitive forms, let's say, to practice, to compete, to win. Again, you see matched verbs in a sentence. Second example, for, for proper editing, we need knowledge, skills, and to use software. You see, something sounds uh, not good. So uh, unmatched. So we should try to edit. We may try, to, we may edit this way. For proper editing, we need knowledge, skills, and we may simply cut third example, leave only two for proper editing, we need knowledge and skills, and discuss about use of software in another sentence. Or if a science editor prefer, somehow may change first part and use uh, uh, something, uh, something different. But all parts, all three parts should be well matched. Students, so third example of parallelism. Students prefer networking, entertaining, and to have fun. So think how you would correct, easy. So you simply pay attention, focus on third uh, phrase and to have fun. Students prefer networking, entertaining, and having fun. So having fun, H have should be used in German form. Pa last example, patience and a healthy control are usually recruited. So you cannot, you should rectify, you should uh, edit these two words and to have the, um, one um, approach, single approach, a single approach. So patience and healthy controls are usually, so you, you pay attention to uh, are here and correct other words. So uh, in our text, medical text, we should also pay attention to referencing. So you edited texts from linguist linguistic point of view. Now, the um, uh, not less important stage is to use references. Avoid my multiple references to a single fact. Always think, always remember about rule of three. 
three examples, uh, even for referencing three, no more than three examples. Do not leave large passages of text without references. Otherwise, it, it will be considered as copying. Distinguish your ideas from those of others. Avoid citing the same reference throughout large passages of track texts. Again, it may suggest that you copied a lot from, even if you paraphrased text, a text and still continue referring to the same reference, it may be uh, judged or considered as copying, referring to uh, uh, the same scientific fact. Cite old references, then consider new, new ones. Always format uh, references manually. You know that uh, we nowadays use Zotero, uh, EndNote, and other reference managers to format our references in articles, but always uh, pay attention to punctuation, to uh, abbreviation of journal titles, and format references manually. Examples of unacceptable yeah. or poorly, ad uh, not advisable, unadvisable uh, style of referencing. You see, multiple examples of the same things. Instead of these multiple or numerous references, only th uh, three up to three references could be left. Another example from Jeffrey Bill's writing. So you see, uh, he wrote uh, an impressive, quite impressive opinion piece and the whole article, the whole opinion piece uh, was referenced by only two references. So it's allowed only in case opinion piece is based on the authors, uh, on an author's own ideas. And uh, to our journal editors message Today's message is to have language editors, English language editors. I refer to Croatian Medical Journal, which is popular in uh, Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe. And they have well, uh, highly skilled or a well-known language editor, uh, linguist who edits accepted manuscripts free of charge. But there are also commercial editing services. Uh, authors may refer to these editing services, um, provided uh, they lack advanced skills or they wish to uh, target nature, science, or top scientific journals. It's better to refer to commercial editing services. So, but it's up to you. In Eastern Europe, uh, authors often refer to commercial editing services. Uh, who are editing without adhering to ethical standards. All these presented commercial editing services are members of Committee on Publication Ethics and they adhere to the best research and publishing uh, publication ethics standards. So over to you. I am open to your questions, comments. Uh, yeah, Arman, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Uh, you have uh, a talent uh, to present uh, complicated uh, things uh, in yeah. a simple and easy thank way. You. <laughs> thank you for your uh, flattering words. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, colleagues, we, in, we encourage our participants uh, to ask uh, questions. Uh, you can simply uh, type them into the chat uh, box uh, on your Zoom control uh, panel. Um, Dr. Arman, I have two questions uh, to you. Uh, the first one about uh, common uh, mistakes uh, uh, in using uh, uh, in using uh, articles uh, in in a Slavic. Uh, Articles. I mean, uh, the and uh, L. Could a, you provide me? A yes. and Z. Okay, yeah, yeah. good. Yeah. So it's quite complicated for uh, non Anglophone um, authors and even for uh, authors who, pub who have published a lot. So the is usually used with nouns which are defined in a text. Let's say a patient 
suffers from something. When you first mention a patient in a sentence, you use article A. But when you continue discussing this patient, you may switch from A to the. Linguists may also comment on this common mistake, but my approach is this way. First, we use A, article A, a patient, and then we switch to the, the patient was treated. Uh, we may also remember some distinguishing words, uh, life, the life, or simply life without this article, the. So if we refer to life as a general thing, we avoid using this defining article the. Life on earth is beautiful, but the life of these pa this patient is complicated. We use here the. So I often see mistakes uh, of Slavic authors when they write articles and they often abundantly use article the. So it's wrong. It's better to avoid using and ask more skilled science editor. Uh, is it common yes. Slavic mistakes? Because uh, in Ukrainian language, you know, we don't have uh, any articles. In most Slavic So in Central and Eastern Europe, the same in Polish texts also. Uh, so you probably know that the uh, Polish rheumatology journal is one of the best rheumatology journal. It's a promotion. So they have language editor. And I noticed that they also pay attention to the and a articles. Um, well, thank you. And uh, we have no uh, one, question, one question from uh, Oksana Zajkivska. Uh, how to use uh, present uh, tense, uh, preferable, as you mentioned, uh, in review article? Oh, yes. That's a good question. Uh, often authors mix uh, tenses in large passages of texts. Texts. If it, if of, of course it's uh, relatively clear to use tenses. Armen, can you hear me? Uh, this is probably. Uh because of uh, bad uh, internet uh, connection uh, of our uh, speaker. I think that he has to switch to other internet provider. I know that he has two internet providers. Uh, well, um, uh, I am very happy uh, to, uh, um, to uh, introduce uh, our uh, next uh, speaker. Um, Dr. Durga Misra, uh, who is uh, one of the leading uh, Indian uh, rheumatologists, uh, editor and uh, author of um, numerous um, articles uh, published uh, in English uh, in medical journals. Uh, Dr. Durga, can you hear me? Hello, Dr. Olena. Good evening. I can yes. hear you. Uh, yes, you can uh, share your screen with us, with your presentation. I hope that uh, Dr. Gasparian <laughs> uh, will change uh, his uh, internet provider uh, to uh, uh, other because he uh, had problem with his internet connection, but uh, he uh, completed his presentation. <laughs> yes, uh, hopefully we'll be able to get him back. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, uh, before I start, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Olena, Dr. Arman and the organizers for inviting me to deliver this lecture on common language mistakes in biomedical articles. It was quite a complicated topic. Uh, to start with, uh, I would like to disclose that I am not a linguist. 
I am an experienced author. I am a rheumatologist, clinical immunologist, and epidemiologist. But I per se am not a language expert. But I shall be attempting to share my experience in writing articles in English. Mistakes that I have made myself commonly, mistakes that I have seen colleagues make, mistakes that I have seen in papers that I have edited or reviewed for, and how we can learn. to avoid those mistakes in our writing in the future to start with appropriate use of language is essential for correct scientific communication and english is the most commonly used language in scientific communication as you can see in this picture taken from wikipedia accessed just earlier today large swathes of the world have few english speaking personnel in their countries there are very few countries that are dominated by english speakers however english remains the predominant channel for scientific communication for sharing one's findings across the scientific community and hence the importance of knowing and appropriately using english language so that we can express to the world what we know to the best of our ability and as a result humanity can progress further so we shall discuss common mistakes in english language usage from the viewpoint of a non linguistic expert as i understand grammatical mistakes shall be discussed separately by an expert speaker subsequently so i shall not focus much on grammatical mistakes per se so what are the first kind of mistakes that can occur mistakes in word form errors in spelling which might alter the meaning of a word for example the achieved results could be explained by the conditional less level of emissions of nitric oxide you could simply avoid using this by saying a lower level of emissions of nitric oxide when the car loses any contact with it's not losses it's when the car loses any contact with then practice and practice these are two common mistakes we shall discuss it in a little more detail later on the transport sector plays a central role in lithuanians modern national economy here it's not lithuanians so it should be the lithuanian modern national economy in this paper motor vehicle hydraulic brake system consisting of two contours is considered here it's not brake b r e a k means a different thing from b r a k e b r e a k means to break something means to destroy something whereas brake is a device that vehicles would have so that you can slow down the vehicle so a small mistake in the spelling changes the entire meaning so one must be very careful to read through what one has written and critically analyze whether it actually is representing what we meant to express or not practice versus practice although in american english very often it is just practice with the c that is used but actually practice is a noun for example my medical practice is thriving which means that the place where i practice my number of patients everything is going well that's why my practice is thriving people are coming to see me as a doctor so my medical practice is thriving whereas practice is a verb i like to practice medicine this is used to demonstrate the art of practicing medicine whereas this was demonstrating the practice of the medicine per se that is the noun form so this is the difference between practice and practice and it's always better to use it appropriately depending on whether we are using it as a noun or as a verb now many of us may wonder what is there in a comma there is this story that we are taught here in india about a judge in the colonial era who was passing judgment on somebody who was definitely guilty he had murdered somebody the the person who was accused of murdering somebody so the judge unfortunately wrote this hang him not comma leave him 
this actually implies innocence of the accused what he meant to write was hang him comma not leave him so this entirely changes the meaning of the judgment so this is an example of how a simple comma can change the meaning of a full statement this meant that the accused was innocent whereas this meant that the accused was guilty similarly another example is panda eats shoots and leaves so this probably means that a panda animal which is commonly seen in parts of asia like in china and other parts this commonly eats shoots and leaves whereas if you put two commas here it says panda eats and then shoots as in shooting a gun and then leaves after shooting so as you can see use of commas appropriately and inappropriately can change the meaning of sentences hence it's very important to use them in a proper manner there is something called as the oxford comma it is generally used before the word and and at the end of a list some authors may consider it it optional but it's always good to know what an oxford comma is and many uh, journals might just ask you to make use of oxford commas appropriately it's often a matter of linguistic style for example the statement these items are available in black and white red and yellow and blue and green so these could mean that pairs of black and white pairs of red and yellow and pairs of blue and green or it could be we sell books comma videos comma and magazines so before the word and and at the end of a list so this is the end of the list so that's why we are using it and before the word and so using commas appropriately can impart great meaning to sentences can change the meaning of sentences hence must be used very carefully another common mistake is in the spelling of words like believe receive a simple formula is i before e except after c so here there is no c before the sequence of i and e hence it goes as b l i e v e for believe fears f i e r c e whereas if there is a c preceding it then it generally goes as e i receive r e c e i v e ceiling c e i l i n g and so on and so forth so whenever you are in doubt regarding whether to use the i first or the e first it's best to remember this formula i before e except after c structure of sentences is the next component authors who are inexperienced might use long complicated sentences to express the information sometimes this may confuse readers a good tip for young authors is to break things down into simple small sentences so let's say if you have something which goes into say four lines of text 60 70 words in a single sentence it's best to use five or six different sentences so that it is much more clearer and it doesn't matter if you use multiple sentences it's better to use that rather than using long complex sentences use of commas and semicolons with conjunctive adverbs conjunctive adverbs are terms like therefore however nevertheless moreover besides accordingly on the other hand for example consequently thus words like these are called as conjunctive adverbs so when we use them to combine two distinct sentences we should precede them with a semicolon and follow them with a comma so for example i mean to talk about a gentleman who is a hard worker and is also very good at poetry so i say that he is a hard worker semicolon moreover comma he is also excellent at poetry both are two distinct things so when you are combining them you use a semicolon then the conjunctive adverb and then a comma after that 
it also may be used for transition as an introductory word or for conversational purposes for example you might want to say in a story about james who was being pressured by his superiors to do something which he didn't feel was right so you might describe the situation and then say james comma however comma did not relent to the pressure of his superiors so here you precede and follow it with a comma so this is how you use conjunctive adverbs very often authors would miss the appropriate use of a comma after a conjunctive adverb many a time sentences may start with conjunctive adverbs like for example on the other hand one must remember to use a comma at the end of it even when it's just a single word like besides or accordingly or thus next comes use of in spite of or despite both these terms can be used interchangeably for example you could say that in spite of the biting cold robert continued his daily routine of running 5 miles or you could say despite the biting cold robert continued his daily routine of running 5 miles what mistake is made by inexperienced authors is sometimes they use despite of which is not the appropriate thing so it's wrong to say despite of the biting cold you could either say despite the biting cold or you could say in spite of the biting cold but not despite of that is the thing that should be avoided next coming to the flow between segments of a manuscript sometimes manuscripts can be complex can have some segments some portions which may not exactly flow from one to the other how can one retain the interest of a reader it is by introducing a logical flow of ideas one must need to keep the reader in mind while writing a manuscript because ultimately a manuscript is written for somebody to read and understand and make use of so unless one keeps in mind the reader unless the reader can make the best use of the manuscript in the future it's not really of much use hence use of a logical flow of ideas which are pre planned helps to retain the interest of the reader and attempt should be made to make segments of a manuscript flow into each other as we shall see in this coming example how we can avoid this lack of flow read a manuscript after completing the draft and critically analyze whether there is a flow in thoughts being expressed in the manuscript or not should certain paragraphs feel disconnected try to use connecting sentences areas of the manuscript particularly prone for this in a research paper are the end of the introduction and beginning of the main content that is the results or in a review article the end of the introduction and beginning of the discussion about the topic end of a discussion and beginning of the conclusion you must pay attention to connect these two parts otherwise they can just appear to abruptly end the discussion and abruptly begin a conclusion without any link between them for example uh, this is taken from a real paper which was discussing about in patients with rheumatic diseases so here as you can see initially i have introduced rheumatology as a specialty and the use of corticosteroids and then the various diseases in which they were used and finally i conclude that nevertheless the authors have raised an important point about the need to evaluate critically the status of therapeutic strategies for rheumatic diseases that minimize corticosteroid use this is particularly an ethical issue in high income countries costlier newer therapies are more accessible than in lesser economically developed regions and then suddenly i go to another topic called problems associated with corticosteroid use somebody may say that it is logical that i'm talking about the problems associated with corticosteroid use but still it somewhat feels abrupt 
when after this you suddenly go to problems associated with corticosteroid use so in the real manuscript there was this connecting sentence in this article we revisit the adverse effects associated with corticosteroid therapy and critically evaluate how far we have actually reached in our search for lesser evils as alternatives to corticosteroids now it makes sense that we are now going to look at adverse effects of corticosteroid therapy and further discuss other issues so this kind of a connecting sentence can help retain the interest of the reader can help make the best effective use of your literature for the reader so because you are retaining their attention you are keeping them involved and they understand why each section is written right from the time you are ending the previous section until the time that you are going to the next section next coming to the use of abbreviations abbreviations is something whose use is increasing daily on an exponential basis particularly with the use of social media it is important to understand that one must limit the use of abbreviations because they can cause the content to be misunderstood for example a study says a study of rf in dm for an internist it may mean a study of renal failure and diabetes mellitus for a rheumatologist it may mean a study of respiratory failure and dermatomyositis and for a physicist it could mean a study of radio frequencies in dark matter all of them are correct so how do we know what are we talking about that is the reason why any abbreviation should be expanded before first use and it is best to limit the use of abbreviations to common widely accepted abbreviations avoid abbreviations in the title unless they are really common abbreviations like for example hiv everybody knows that hiv is human immunodeficiency virus very few other abbreviations should be used in the title preferably not in the title it's best to always spell out the entire full form rather than use an abbreviation and it's also good practice to provide a list of abbreviations in alphabetical order on the title page of the manuscript so that at the beginning of your manuscript should it be accepted your abbreviation list is printed out somebody can easily refer to it and find out exactly what you mean by the abbreviation that you are using informal language it is preferable to maintain a formal tone during scientific communication one should state facts as they are and let the content of the written matter excite the audience rather than the tone for example overstating facts it's something that should be avoided cautious use of language is the norm in scientific publication and this is what young authors should strive to do sometimes we may share opinions or perceptions as opposed to facts this is particularly important in narrative review articles wherein authors often need to express their own opinion or perception on matters it is important to distinguish which statement that we make in a particular article is based on opinion and which is based on hard evidence in the published literature with reference to it otherwise people may confuse what you are saying to be based on the literature when it is actually opinion and vice versa and something which is based on hard evidence in the published literature is obviously of much greater value to the scientific community than something which is based on the opinion of the author so it's important to distinguish this when you're writing your manuscript using the language that you've written overstating facts as i said is something that one should avoid necessarily authors would like to impress upon readers on the importance of their work however one must exercise caution to tone down the language it is preferable to understate rather than overstate facts for example somebody may state in the discussion of a paper this is the first study to assess risk factors for death in indian patients with rheumatoid arthritis in the present decade so how can we critique this 
statement for its usage of language. First study, how extensively have the authors searched? How sure are the authors that another study similar to this has not been published before? If you restrict your search to a single database, you may actually think this is the first study, but let's say, for example, you have searched Medline. Medline is a less extensive database, although it's freely accessible and very useful. So you might not have found a similar study on Medline. But if you look at Scopus or Web of Science, which are more extensive databases, a couple of people might have actually looked at this aspect. So before telling the first study, it is important to critically analyze how true your statement is or how true it is not. How sure are you that another study similar to this has not been published? The second is in Indian patients. Why is it important for the journal and its readers to know about Indian patients? Are you potentially limiting the scope of your readers? So be very careful while making such statements. And third is the present decade. The present decade is only one year and five days old. Is your study still relevant if 20 similar studies were published between 2010 to 2019? So that's why it's best to avoid overstating the importance of your study by making a statement like this. And rather, it would have been better for the authors to say that we assessed risk factors for death in Indian patients with rheumatoid arthritis and then discuss the findings of the study rather than trying to overstate it that this is the first study in the present decade assessing this. This might actually backfire and the editors and reviewers might not like this and your paper may not have a favorable outcome. So a better way of presenting such data is even if you're very sure that this is indeed the first study that has looked at it, you say that to the best of our knowledge, this is the first study to have assessed this problem. So here the authors are being humble. They are acknowledging the limit of their knowledge. To the best of their knowledge, this is the first study to have assessed this. There obviously does remain a possibility that somebody else might have assisted and they might not be aware of it. And reviewers and editors would like this. They would know that you are not overstating your facts. Or you could say we could not find similar studies assessing this problem previously. Our novel study assesses so, so, so. So again, here you're stating the same thing that this is the first study, but you are stating it in a manner that shows that you understand the limitation of your literature searches or the potential limitations of your literature searches. And you understand that there still remains a possibility this might not be the first study this might be the first study that you are aware of, but there might be some other study that has looked at it. And that's always possible. Although one should do as extensive a literature search as possible to try to avoid missing similar studies, but it may be possible that you might have missed a paper that has been published before on this. And now hence you think that this is the first study when it actually is not. But if you state it in this manner, if you state it in a humble manner, it's always more soothing to the readers, more soothing to the reviewers and editors, and they take it more kindly, your statement. Another issue is an association or a causal association. An association is merely a statistical relationship between two variables, whereas a causal association implies that a a uh, cause leads to an effect. So this landmark paper was published in 1965. And this was by Sir Austin Bradford Hill in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Medicine, now known as the Journal of Royal Society of Medicine, which proposed the Bradford Hill criteria for causality. So how can we be sure about causality? These criteria proposed in 1965 are still valid today. And these are based on nine different parameters. What is the strength of an association? How strong is the association? For example, how, how much is the degree of correlation between two variables? If it is a very high correlation, then the association strength is quite high. 
consistency of an association if different studies have assessed this association and have found this association then it is a consistent association across studies specificity of this association is this association of this disease with biomarker say for example a particular biomarker in rheumatoid arthritis is it specific to rheumatoid arthritis or is it also found with other inflammatory diseases like spondyloarthritis or lupus the temporal sequence is there a clear temporal sequence between the exposure and the outcome if so a causal association is more likely but a temporal sequence may not always be evident in certain study designs as we shall see subsequently a biological gradient is there a dose response curve that is seen for example the association between smoking and lung cancer greater degree of smoking is associated with higher risk of lung cancer and hence it's likely to be a biological gradient that is guiding this association and it's more likely to be causal plausibility is it possible to explain this association by what we understand about human biology what we understand about science or is the explanation not easily visible for example if somebody conducted a study on suicide rates and air pollution one might find a statistical association between higher suicide rates at times when air pollution was higher but can we really link the two together can we find a definite hypothesis that can explain this if not such an explanation may not be plausible coherence again is it a coherent explanation does it make sense or does it not make sense experiment is there a experimental model that has established this for example an experimental model in an animal experiment that has looked at this exposure leading on to the outcome this lends credence to a causal association rather than just a simple association and analogy is there another similar relationship described for another similar set of variables for example uh, anti citrullinated peptide antibodies acpa and rheumatoid arthritis there is a similar relationship between rheumatoid factor and rheumatoid arthritis so there is an analogy available in the literature that can support a hypothesis for a causal association so each of these points or a majority of these points must be fulfilled for an association to be considered causal authors often make the problem in the language that they might denote causality when an association actually cannot be determined to be causal or not so what studies can assess causality cohort studies where the exposure has occurred and then you are following up this group of individuals so the temporal sequence is very clear or interventional studies like clinical trials but if it's a cross sectional study or a case control study then here often whether the hen comes before the egg or the egg comes before the hen is not clear the temporal sequence is not clear so if a uh, inference was made from a study design where causality could be assessed you might say that authors believe that smoking could have resulted in a proportion of their longitudinal cohort developing lung cancer whereas if a similar inference has been drawn from a cross sectional study or a case control study where the temporal sequence of exposure preceding the outcome is not very clear you might have to say that the authors found that smoking was strongly associated with lung cancer here you cannot infer that smoking led to the development of lung cancer because these studies cannot give you causal associations so you must use an appropriate language to denote your results whether what you are describing is a simple association or a causal association and using this language carefully will help the editor and the reviewer understand that the authors really understand the implications of their study and the limitations of the study design 
and it builds confidence in the author group. Inappropriate use of correlation. Let's say, for example, a study looked at differences in LDL cholesterol between those with body weight less than 50 kg and those with body weight greater than 50 kg. Authors may say LDL cholesterol levels correlated with body weight, whereas they have divided it into two groups based on body weight and LDL cholesterol, what they found was different in between these two groups. It actually didn't correlate with body weight. It was different in the two groups based on body weight. So it's not appropriate to use correlated here. Before using correlated, we need to conduct a formal correlation analysis in the form of a Pearson's correlation coefficient or a Spearman's rank correlation. Only then we can say that it's correlated. LDL cholesterol might have a relationship with body weight, but here it doesn't show that it's correlated. So again, just use of appropriate language helps to put forth the appropriate message to the readers. Next comes how to identify and correct language errors. Practice makes a man perfect. Rome was not built in a day. It took a number of years to build a beautiful city like Rome. So it is just that repeatedly practicing the use of appropriate correct language may help one to improve one's writing in the longer term. So how do you identify and correct language errors? One's peers are the best route to improve one's writing. Request a colleague to critique your writing. Take help of a mentor. Ask to mark changes to your manuscript using track changes feature of a word processor software. This will help you understand where are the language mistakes that you might have made. Or you can take help of a colleague experienced in writing scientific articles in English. Very often authors from non-anglophone countries might encounter comments like, please seek the help of a native English speaker. These comments might be attached to their manuscript. I would suggest that editors and reviewers should avoid using such statements because there are two assumptions made by this statement that are not necessarily true. It assumes that everyone in the world has ready access to a native English speaker and it also assumes that every native English speaker writes flawless English. So it's always better to put it like, please seek the help of a colleague who is experienced in writing scientific articles in English, rather than simply seeking the help of a native English speaker. Dr. Arman had mentioned about certain editing agencies which ethically edit the language of manuscripts and authors might consider using them if they have none of these options available. However, it is important that if such an editing agency help has been used, it should be transparently declared at the time of submitting an article for publication. There are free online softwares that are available. One commonly used software is Grammarly. Fortunately, this software grammar checking function is available free of cost. And there are also various other softwares. Most of them are fully or partly free to use for grammar checking. For inexperienced authors, it's best to use at least two sources to check the grammar of their articles, particularly if they're not confident about the usage of English language in their text. What is the real life relevance of language errors in manuscripts? When a manuscript is submitted to a journal, an editor would screen the manuscript first. If it is too poorly written to be understandable, then manuscripts are often returned back to authors to resubmit after improving the language. However, if there are some grammatical errors, but it is overall appearing to be scientifically sound, they are likely to send it out for peer review. In my personal experience, English language errors alone rarely result in rejection. If the study has got sound methods and well-presented results with some English language errors, it's more likely to go for a revision rather than a rejection. However, an article written in flawless English 
but whose methods and results are flawed, then the use of a flawless English is not going to save this manuscript from a likely rejection. So it ultimately boils down to the content of your manuscript that really makes the difference. And it is the use of good language, appropriate language, that helps get the best experience out of your manuscript so that you can, in a best way, present your findings to the scientific community. They can understand it in the best possible manner and use it in the best possible manner for the advancement of humanity. So to conclude, standing at the foot boys, gazing at the sky, how can you get up boys if you never try? You must always try to write and improve your language in your scientific articles. That's the only way to improve English language writing. It is a continuing process and every day you learn how to write better. The more you write, the better you're likely to become in writing and take appropriate help of softwares that are freely available so that you can improve your language and many free softwares are available which you can use to correct common language errors. Thank you. Uh, Dia Durga, uh, thank you very much for your excellent and very useful presentation. Uh, I have a question to you. Uh, do you, you use uh, some uh, software uh, during your writing and which one uh, do you use, uh, Grammarly or probably ProWriting Aid? Uh, actually, I myself hardly ever use any software, oh. but initially I might have used Grammarly at times, mm -hmm. uh, the English language checking section of it, particularly if the editors of a manuscript might have put a comment about the improvement of the language, then I would go back and use Grammarly. Okay, you recommend uh, to use uh, Grammarly. <laughs> I understood. Thank you. Yes. yes. Thank you. Another, another question to Durga. So thank you very much, Durga. Thank you for your sacrifice you. for uh, sharing uh, your knowledge, experience with our non mostly non-anglophone authors. So you do not use software for writing your own articles. However, as a uh, journal editor, what type of software, uh, uh, what software would you prefer to use for as a journal editor, as a copy editor? Let's say. Uh, I'm not sure about as a copy editor, but all our articles go through Turnitin now, previously Authenticate. But that's mostly for plagiarism check. I'm not sure what copy editors really use for grammar checks. Okay, you probably that... know Durga. Uh, sorry, go on, Alina. Uh, I would like to say that Grammarly we also can use for this purpose, for plagiarism <laughs> yeah. checking Grammarly, yes. Okay. Uh, but uh, the problem is that uh, large publishers outs outsourced their editing to India, to Indian agencies and agents. And at the moment, some of these publishers publish articles without perfect editing. So it's it could be because of using software, but it could be also because of uh, uh, over, oversight of these Indian editors. You probably know that most large publishers refer and rely on Indian copy editors and editors. So I am far from uh, Indian copy editors and editors, but I understand that there is something wrong and I wanted to sort out what the problem with this editing. You probably also, all of us know that most journals do not edit language. They simply accept and uh, send to proofreaders without substantive editing. However, some emerging or startup journals need substantive editing. And I use substantive editing, manual editing, for let's say one of the emerging journals Central Asian Journal of Medical Hypothesis and Ethics. So emerging 
uh, or startup journals need substantive editing to attract, to improve readability and attract good authors. Whereas large publishers simply accept articles uh, in acceptable in the, in well, relatively well edited uh, English. So just uh, you or Latika uh, probably could comment on this and share your knowledge. Um, send message to other uh, publishers, large publishers, what to do. Latika, uh, are you with us? I totally agree that. Uh, so yeah, I know that Latika is, uh, you are a great editor and you work for several journals. You probably also noticed that uh, articles are published with language mistakes, with uh, oversight of unbalanced, unmatched texts. So why is that? In your yeah, opinion? I think this needs to be looked into probably. Uh, they are not using any language editing services, the copy editors. I do suspect that. Some, some Central European and Eastern European journals, like a Polish Journal of Rheumatology, Croatian Medical Journal, they have uh, linguists uh, uh, in, in their staff uh, editing all accepted papers. And I, I also personally, uh, I published some articles with these journals and I noticed that their journal editors uh, acted as language editors, not just copy editors. So you probably know that uh, large publishers also have some uh, di different tiers of copy editing or editing. So substantive editing requires payment, huge amount of payment, whereas copy editing is free. So I also struggle as a consulting editor of a startup journal. I also see that uh, we process articles and accept articles without lacking substantive, um, requiring substantive editing. So uh, I hope that today's uh, participants, some of participants, particularly Solomia from Lviv, would also comment on that, how uh, language editors act in Central and Eastern Europe. Okay, so no other comments, questions, probably later, if yes. Uh, we have some questions from our participants, from Viktor Zvonar. Uh, are however and therefore really redundant words uh, or necessary links? <laughs> Uh, yes, I mentioned about uh, redundant words and phrases in uh, articles. I understand that non-anglophone authors often uh, put a lot of so-called redundant words and phrases. It has been established for the first time, time we've, uh, we've obtained this data. So these type of phrases are common in non-anglophone uh, writings, uh, manuscripts. British or uh, so-called native English speakers often cut this type of redundant phrases. So these are really redundant because there is no value, no weight, no scientific meaning in this type of phrases. Yeah, for the first time we've, we've established or uh, it's been established these type of phrases are really redundant in scientific articles. Even hedges, some of, it, of the hedges can be useful in uh, sociology, psychology, hum, uh, humanity and arts articles, but in medical articles, hedges and emotional expressions should be cut. Well, and the second question uh, also from Victor, uh, when do we not set off which sentence by commas? Commas, ah, yeah. Uh, Victor, we discussed uh, punctuation and we discussed um, defining and non-defining clauses in articles, in sentences, particularly uh, when we use which and that. There is no need to use comma when you use that and uh, related clauses. Whereas when you use which, 
sometimes it is necessary to use commas to distinguish, to separate that clause from the rest of the sentence. So with which you can use, again, sometimes. With that, quite rare, never. Uh, well, and the last question from our Bulgarian participant from uh, Sevdalina uh, about passive and active voice. Uh, we observed and it was observed. Uh, do you recommend to avoid uh, intentionally passive? Uh, yes, Sevdalina is right. So in scientific writing, writings, we would prefer active voice. Uh, we, may, we may completely uh, cut sentence into several parts and then merge and, and then construct the sentence again without using passive voice. Uh, passive voice phrases like it was observed, it has been observed. No. Uh, the results are or uh, CRP level is something. Uh, we, but not, we uh, were seeing something with passive voice unacceptable for most science editors. And this type of editing is common with British editors. They do not like passive voice in medical texts. Thank you. And you should also pay attention, Sevdalina, if you are involved in your journals or somewhere, the same with Latika, the same with Durga, Olena. If you see active uh, passive voice, ask your authors to uh, revise, re, uh, reward, and straighten up straight, straightforward sentences without uh, circuitous uh, sentences. Thank you. Uh, okay, and final question from Yulia Kuzik, pathologist. Uh, do you recommend using uh, interrogative sentences uh, in articles, uh, especially in debates? Yes, uh, Julia, you are quite right. Uh, we may use in, uh, question marks in titles of articles to attract attention. And let's say Latika knows how to attract attention of audience, uh, participants, and also readers. And as a social media editors, Olena and Latika Gupta, they also know that question marks increase uh, downloadability of some articles. However, question marks not suitable for uh, original, most original research papers, descriptive titles, let's say you described uh, uh, main results, uh, outcomes in the title. There is no need to use question mark or interrogative questions. These type of uh, question marks are used for narrative reviews. Even for systematic reviews, there is no need to use question mark. Question marks mostly used for narrative reviews, for editorials, editorials are also quite attractive and useful for quality of journals and for prestige of scientific authors. So I'm sure that Latika published, Latika and Durga published editorials uh, in Indian Journal of Rheumatology and it's considered as uh, prestige if you are invited to write editorials. So I hope next time you write your editorials, you will also uh, recall question by uh, Yulia Kuzik, who is professor from uh, Lviv, uh, specialist who writes a lot, who um, also specialist in vasculitis, if I am not mistaken. So attractive titles are used for narrative reviews and editorials. Uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, Latika. Uh, would you like to be uh, the next presenter, uh, Vitalina, if you don't mind, because of some uh, uh, internet, internet uh, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Latika, uh, she will be talking. She is uh, one of the leading Indian rheumatologists, <laughs> clinician, uh, editor. <laughs> uh, 
highly skilled editor and uh, specialist uh, in uh, social media and she will be talking about proper use of English uh, for post-publication article promotion in social media. Alatika, please. Thank you, Alina, for uh, a kind introduction and as always, it's an absolute pleasure to meet uh, all the lovely people here. Uh, so as you all are aware, um, in this pandemic period, social media is the new frontier in academia, which has opened up for all of us to um, move online for learning and research and collaborations and discussions and everything has moved online in this period. And uh, it is time to pay attention to the language of social media and, and uh, how we draft our tweets and uh, posts on social media platforms. Now, the best, uh, some distinctive advantages to this, there are no clear rules. So uh, we may enjoy some liberty to uh, make our own, but um, we definitely need to conform to certain existing norms. And uh, there can be challenges as well, uh, which we would meet on the way, like there are no spell check on Twitter. There are obviously poorly defined rules. There's no edit button. This is something which people have uh, been complaining about for a long time, but Twitter has um, uh, knowingly not included that because it's an opinionated platform. So either it's there or it's deleted. There's no edit button to it. So, um, the biggest challenge is uh, to not err because uh, whatever said and done uh, in the language of Twitter itself, for those of you who follow uh, the crown, to be impartial is not natural and not human. So humans um, by nature and um, by uh, um, inherently they are, in, they are partial and they judge and this is inherent to being human. and. Uh, the presence on social media and the researcher profiles can be the um, your portrayal of self to the world or a window um, into your achievements to the outside world. And uh, hence, it is very important to be politically correct, respectful, avoid copyright infringement, uh, and have appropriate disclosures in the match. So these are general rules which we may have touched upon in the previous lectures. But uh, the real challenge can come with language, uh, especially for those who are um, not native English speakers and uh, the absence of an edit button. So sometimes you've hit send and um, there's a typo or something else and you may end up committing to something else. So uh, today we will be touching upon sentence length and structure, uh, not too much in detail because the first two talks have largely covered those but only some specific issues which may um, um, help you relate with Twitter posts and compose them better. And uh, we'll talk in detail about punctuation marks, which you'll be using a lot um, on social media platforms, smileys, hashtags, and the language of Twitter. So uh, a sentence structure is of course important and uh, most of the basics uh, are the same as uh, that in standard English language and uh, writing a research article. But uh, the language of Twitter can also be different at times because uh, we are limited to, eight, to 280 characters. Uh, previously, this was 140 until November 2017, but thankfully it's much more now. And um, we have the advantage on social media platforms uh, of uh, being able to include a lot of photographs and videos and blog posts and other links. So uh, videos can include live streaming, they can be hyperlinked to other online resources. So, so uh, as picture and multimedia, they can say more than words. So, so that is where you have an edge. The non-Anglophone speakers and readers and uh, researchers, they can put in a lot of information there uh, and at the same time be concise. And there's also the option of short polls uh, with Twitter. So before we um, discuss this further, let's uh, familiarize ourselves with the essential Twitter vocabulary, that is the hashtags, which you, uh, all of you, I hope are aware of. This is the pound uh, sign, which is our symbol, which is followed by word or phrase, like, uh, and with this facilitates um, the use of uh, certain acronyms as well on Twitter, because some of the acronyms may be trending or uh, may be available. People may have uh, described the expanded form so unlike a manuscript where you have to always expand the short forms, that is not a norm on Twitter. You can just use a pound sign and people 
can just click on that hashtag, search for that keyword, and somewhere they can also find the full form like TGIF or thank God it's Friday for those who are looking forward to the weekend or first world problems for those uh, who are um, privileged and have specific problems like they don't have the latest iPhone. And learn English for those of you who are wanting to learn um, a language on Twitter. We will talk more about this uh, over the next few slides. So with hashtags, they're like keywords. So uh, like the mesh terms through your tweets are easier to find and they can also be used to talk about specific topics or interact with people who are talking about similar topics. And um, tweet is a noun and there are messages on Twitter. Like did you see Beyonce's latest tweet? But they can also be used as a verb. So which is the action of posting. I tweeted a lot today. So these uh, this is a standard language, which I hope you're familiar with. And DM is a direct message and RT is retweet. So uh, you retweet something, either you agree with it or you want to spread that information. You want others to read it. And mentions are basically tags. Like if you're using more of Facebook in Ukraine and adjacent regions, then you tag someone. And uh, on Twitter, this is called a mention. That is the at sign followed by their name. And Twitter is an algorithm where you start typing out the name and it tries to guess who it is. Uh, and uh, those whom you follow and who follow you will come up first. So if I am typing O-L-E, then it'll pick up Olina from my list and it'll be the first suggestion. And then feed is a list of tweets from all the accounts you follow on Twitter. So why we're we talking so much about Twitter today? Because it has holds a lot of potential um, it's for learning language. Um, using this platform, you go there for entertainment or for information, but the information you get is varied and, and there is a lot of it. So the input can be uh, not just linguistic, but also cultural. So linguistic in terms of the grammar and vocabulary you passively absorb from people who are tweeting and writing there, or you can specifically follow various accounts and platform uh, on these social media platforms um, of teachers or editing services or Grammarly. So all of these are Oxford English, Cambridge English. We'll talk about that in, the, uh, in, in some of the later slides. And then there's a cultural component to it, so which is very important, like American English may be different from British English, and you'll be exposed to all kinds of speakers there on social media platforms. It is also up to date, and, and uh, it can also be the information you'll be pertaining to trending topics. So uh, it's a very diverse, stimulative experience, and a very immersive one, provided you're ready to uh, take it on. And you can interact with native speakers, with fellow learners, which can be the best form of learning. Peer learning is the best kind. And then teachers, institutions, then there are also chatbots. So uh, do not underestimate there are plenty of those out there. But yes, there's potential to learn from those as well. And then your output, which is simpler. It's in form of tweets. So tweets are short, crisp, so they're easier to produce in comparison to large manuscript. And uh, uh, they can also be longer pieces and sharing links, of course. And then speaking, there's a speaking component to it. If you can read out the tweets aloud or, or just interact with the audio or video content or you post uh, podcasts or create videos, then all of that can also be output. And uh, to start with, uh, way back in 2006, 98% of tweets were written in English. But uh, by 2013, this had totally changed and tweets in English had fallen to 51%. So it's not a platform just for English. Even if you're targeting any other languages, then that may be the platform. And as you can see, there are diverse ethnic groups and people speaking different languages. Now Twitter itself supports 40 different languages and translation tool can identify the language of the tweet and translate it to the default language of the user's account. Now, um, the Twitter style, just to introduce you to the concept, tweeting and creating any kind of post may be different uh, than how you write a standard manuscript, like this one by one of our rheumatologists based out of London. Great list by at lupus reference. So this at, he's tagging or mentioning another account. And this is this person. He's a French rheumatologist who works on lupus my initial clinical takeaway points from ACR20, which is the um, uh, biggest rheumatology conference every year. So, and, and a hashtag, because there will be many posts and people following what is happening at the ACR. 
So they will all follow this hashtag and are likely to find this tweet, even if they're not following Chris. And then a very stimulative tweet with a lot of emojis, as you can see. And then you use the slash and equal to effective and safe. So it is concise. There is some excitement there with an exclamation mark. They are all separate sentences or so that is mainly to get attention. And it, as you can see, the composition and style is very different. Again, another one with similar structure, a lot of smileys, hashtags, mention the key points. It's important to have it crystal clear. What is the information you're trying to deliver and, and what is it that you want to highlight? So uh, with regard to sentence structure, just a few takeaway points. Uh, you have to avoid long and difficult to read sentences, as Dr. Durga just said. And uh, particularly, there's a tendency of non-anglophone speakers to um, include which, like the ethyl acetate phase was dried under a gentle stream of nitrogen. I think he had the nitrogen example pulled up as well and was then redissolved with TML of the LUNB. This is fine because we have an and, and and we have a comma here, but the ethyl acetate phase which had been dried under a gentle stream. So this is wrong English and this should be avoided. The easiest bet would be to just split it into two sentences as here. So we avoid the which examples include A, B, and C, which are normally established once a month. Here we don't know which of these was established once a month. Was it A, B, or C? But here you can say examples include A, B, and C. A and B are normally established once a month. So whenever the sentence is too long and seems stretched, just, just split it into two. Or we can use one of the other punctuation marks, which we will come to in a minute. This is another example of a good tweet. Rockstar performance. So the words here, they um, are meant to elate your mood or, or give you some, into some excitement by Pfizer. 95% effectiveness after seven days of second dose. I'm just amazed at the amount of information this tweet holds. Effective just about 10 days after the first dose. So again, it's pushing for the vaccine. Need data on immunocompromise and, and autoimmune disease. So there's a bit of honesty there that yes, this is not, this seems like very perfect tweet, including long-term safety. So it is, it the, the author has some reservations about some aspects of vaccines, but then finally some good news. So finally and good. Cheers. So an exclamation mark and excitement and an image to complement the tweet. So this is a very complete, wholesome picture of how a tweet should be composed and um, also grammatically correct. Again, this is a different one where it's really concise. So brevity, as I always say, is an art and um, something uh, one should always aspire to master's risk benefits strongly in favor of vaccine, period. Everybody should get it, that's it. And then a picture to say more than a thousand words. So that is the other way of doing it and uh, something which uh, you can get better at with practice. Then coming to punctuation marks, as you can see, they're very important because uh, they can also save lives and otherwise we may end up eating grandma. So uh, punctuations, first we will talk about apostrophes. So contracted forms are often used in tweets because of the imposed word limits. And um, if you don't know where to put it, it doesn't mean that you put it anywhere. So uh, the main use is to form the genitive. And the only other use is if we wanna make it clear to the reader how a word is constructed. So uh, what is a genitive? It is mainly to you used to show possession. So with nouns, it is used to create adding an S to the word or by proceeding with of. Like, but do not use it to make acronyms and dates plural. So never use it for plural, use it for genitive. And in my email, I cc'd, cc'd, it's carbon copied, the co-authors who all have PhDs. So we would not, we brought six PCs, which is fine. But if we put an apostrophe here, that is for the plural, which will be incorrect. Our institute was founded in the 1980s. Again, this is plural, which is correct. But if we added an apostrophe here, it will be incorrect. Then a colon, a most common use is to introduce a list. So as Dr. Durga said, you often see it in a title 
and it can divide a two part title of a paper presentation. So if you're tweeting about the title, yes, it may come up there or the word. Um, and the main question is what happens to the word after the colon is capitalized. It can be, it may not be, it's not mandatory to have it capitalized, but preferably yes. In such cases, a dash can also be used in place of a colon, but do not, you can use a colon to add further thoughts and explanations, but it is conditional. So we will see in a minute. But um, if it's creating a very long sentence, that no, you should avoid it and preferably split it up into two sentences. So <clears throat> space debris, the, new, the need for new regulations. So this is how a colon can be used. X can be used as an identifier. Y cannot. So here you can see that you can also use a full stop in place of a colon and that will be absolutely fine. In fact, sometimes that can be, um, that can emphasize things better because it's a stronger uh, punctuation mark than a colon. And in tweets, you will often find people using this. So um, punctuation commas are also often used on social media platforms, again, because you're trying to squeeze in a lot of information in the 280 odd character limit. So uh, mainly to separate out two different clauses, and especially uh, when you are using if, when, as, soon as, after, or one of these uh, clauses are introduced by one of these words. So when the specimen is dry, remove it from the recipient. So yes, these are two separate clauses, so you have to separate them with a comma, but if you don't, then that is an error. And um, the themes, so this is a non-defining relative clause. The themes, which runs through London, is England's longest river. <clears throat> so here, for uh, so here you're using a comma to separate out these two clauses and to define it. And then this one, there are three advantages of this: costs are lower, deadlines and other constraints are more easily met, and customers are generally happier. So if there was no comma after met, then this, this, this has to usually highlight the penultimate and the last element are separate terms. So it's typically used in, um, in I think, American English. And this, this should always, you should make sure that before the penultimate one, after the penultimate one, you have to put a comma. <clears throat> Now, sentences which uh, begin with adverbs like clearly, interestingly, or, or link word that indicate that you're coming on to something more important than, um, or consequently, or in addition, then here again, you need to use a comma. And these words, you'll often find yourself using them um, in research papers. When do you not use a comma? So it's very important to know when not to do something. So when the 20 words or more, so it's a very long sentence and clearly you're just trying to push yourself too hard. So you uh, should pause, take a break, and then just remove the comma and put a full stop and rearrange the sentence or write two separate sentences. Or if there's a very long list of items and the items are, you know, like just jumbled up and that it seems like that's more groups there's, and there's subgroups, so there are 10 items, but there are under three groups, then um, clearly a comma may not always separate them out. You need a stronger punctuation mark and a semicolon may be better. So looking at examples, this application was developed specifically for this purpose. It can be used on most platforms. Here, we're using which and exploiting the comma to just go on with a very long sentence, which is not acceptable. And we use various sets of characters, that is A, B, and C, D, E, and F. So as I said, there are three sets and there are subsets, but if you jumble them all up and keep adding add and comma, then that is incorrect. Then uh, if there are a series of nouns and the first and the second noun are not related. So essentially those are two separate clauses, we're talking about two separate nouns and Instead, you should begin the sentence, a new sentence after the first noun or in a defining relative clause. You'll see in a minute, examples to make it more clear. So um, each row in the page represents an individual record, comma, the information and the features provided enable the user to control and monitor. So here we're talking about a record and then we're talking about the information and features, which are two separate things. 
So you put a full stop and then you talk about the information and features. And the student that gets the top marks is awarded the prize. So here, as you say, in a defining relative cause, the student that gets the top mark. So it's already defining the sentence. Here, you will not use a comma. <coughs> so um, I bet some of you may ask us that uh, since we have editage and we have Grammarly and we have all these wonderful softwares, why do we still need to go through the grind? Because even uh, so many years after the vacuum cleaner has been designed and invented, yet the broomstick is still in use. So you still need the human touch for your manuscripts and more so for social media platforms. Coming to the dash, um, sometimes you need to use this for diversity sake and also uh, for that the comma may not be appropriate because it is stronger than two commas, but it is lighter than the parenthesis. So it is mainly for afterthoughts to a final command. It really gives the effect, like taking this process into account, we would expect undesirable products <clears throat> to form in donor atoms. So, but you can also split it up into two sentences, <clears throat> which is absolutely fine and may even be better. And uh, X does not in fact correspond to Y. And this is what we had expected or suspected. So this is slight drama in here, you know, it gets more attention, but yes, you can always split it up into two different sentences. Um, very important use of the hyphen, uh, which is a smaller dash, um, particularly in research manuscripts, a 30 year old patient. So when two nouns that is year and old, they're, they're joining to form an adjective to describe another noun. 30 year old patient. So 30 year and old, 30 and year and old, they are together forming an adjective, 30 year old patient. So here you have to use it, six fingered hand. Yes, but never put, don't make it six fingers. So that'll be wrong. Then use a word that acts as a prefix to the following word. So avoid time consuming. We use row based flashing. Or there are series of prefixes, there are two prefixes uh, referring to the same noun, like control of the interaction is user, but not application driven. So these are two prefixes to the same noun. So control of the interaction is user, but not application. So here again, you use the hyphen. Uh, this is again in, a, I think, the British um, English, non-essential. So whenever you use the word non, you have to have a hyphen, but this is not essential. So uh, in the American and um, uh, other forms of English, you can do away with hyphen here. It is not absolute, and you can even do away with the um, space between non and essential. And uh, another important aspect, suppose you are having a prefix, uh, writing a prefix to um, capitalize noun. The noun obviously has to be in capital and there has to be a hyphen in between. If you are describing mixtures or analysis that combine two elements like chemical, physical, hydrogen, oxygen mixture, then yes, again, you use the hyphen. Another important one, which can be slightly complicated is join a noun to a pre preposition like clean up, back up. So when the machine is started up, make sure, but this is a verb joining a preposition. But here, this feature is only available at startup. To a preposition. So here you use a hyphen. And to clarify ambiguity, this is a little used car. We don't know if the car is little or if it is little used. So you put a hyphen there, a second hand car that is small in size, the used car. A little used car means it has been rarely driven. So it can be very important in defining what exactly the sentence means. And um, the last but not the least, you may have used this a lot or seen it in research manuscripts. We present three state of the art solutions. So this, these are noun, adjective and prepositions, which are together acting like an adjective when they're put together. 
well and known together they you know separately they don't mean anything they'll be like well is good and known it is known but well known it it assumes an important role together when the when these words come together and that's when you put a hyphen in between and periods it, they are typically not used at the end of titles or at the end of headings so this is something you need to be clear about and avoid in your tweets and social media posts as well so uh, i know a lot of you <laughs> may be asking if we are there yet yes we are almost but not quite so quotations is again something these are you will be using in uh, tweets and social media platforms and posts so if the quotation is short you incorporate it into the main text if it is long then you indent the paragraph and begin a new paragraph this you will see a lot in tweets and uh, if there are words and phrases that you used in a special way then you use quotations like we call this phenomenon venting which is a variation of the so called vent synergism so you are giving it a separate meaning or using it in a different sense um how do the blind see so very recent post from another rheumatologist from netherlands and you see he's talking about the um brain activity so here you use the apostrophe and then the bullets uh, again widely exploited on social media platforms to make a point and to be concise and crystal clear so round bullets are used when the sequence is not important can you use 1 2 3 only when the sequence is important ticked bullets can you use them any time generally used only in reports and presentations to list what actions have already been taken like if you use a tick i can use them only now because i've covered all three points and um, this is an example um we have made the following changes so here you can use ticks the project is organized into three phases specification design and release yes this seems like the right order so this you can use 1 2 and 3 and here bullet will be inappropriate how not to use bullet points if they are if there is disparity in the length of uh, the various points one is a very long bullet point and the others are short no that's not right and this is another example where a very well composed tweet and um, crystal clear he has not used bullet points but could have but i think he's done a great job even without it so this is how you organize your data and put a lot of it in there in one tweet in 280 characters so um how to um place the bullets so there should ideally be some a uh, space between the bullet point and the text that you're trying to put in there and avoid justifying the text this is something you need to remember and consistency is important so you have to avoid redundancy use the same style of punctuation capitalization and avoid unnecessary words like dr durga said to avoid use of redundant words like um suppose acquire information so these data are used to acquire information understand the importance and highlight any deficiencies so if we were to use unnecessary words like for the acquisition to understand so this this is just a waste and um, again the decomposition into individual modules is these three but if you start using the word module in each of these and the entire purpose is lost so bullet is mainly to clump similar kinds of information together without having to use um, additional words and um, for capitals um when you are composing tweet you may need to uh, use headlines and often times you'll be confused where do i use capitals and where not so um so if it is a title all the words except these will start with capital letters like a b it and and all pre prepositions alternatively you can also use just the first word in capital sentence case and the rest in small letters and do not use a period which we talked about earlier so captain capital reminds you to use capital letters for your memory the letter i beginning of sentence name of people places and holidays months and days of the week this is very important something people forget titles of books games programs and people like a guide to the use of english in scientific documents but this one is also okay where only a is in capital 
and North Korea, East Timor, South America, all of these are in capitals. The Faculty of Economics, University of Bangkok. So these are capitals. So please note that most of the nouns, people, places, holidays, months, days, programs, and games, they're all in capitals. Now coming to the most interesting of our punctuation marks, the exclamation mark is the friendliest and it is the strongest punctuation mark in your arsenal. Use it very carefully. It usually conveys strong feelings like surprise, anger, excitement, or joy. And uh, how many exclamations are too many? So generally, any more than one is left to the semi-professional writing at best. Adding multiple exclamation marks does not magically increase the uh, emotional impact of what is being said and runs the risk of making a writing look unprofessional. So you have to be careful. It is useful, but only when used in moderation. So let's go through an example. Uh, this lady is a writer from Britain. And every email I ever send, hello, I'm extremely excited to be corresponding with you. You can tell by the number of exclamation points I use. Here is one sentence with a period so I don't come across as a manic. Thanks. So this um, uh, exemplifies how exciting one can sound with exclamation marks and almost run the risk of being called a maniac. So a sarcastic humor at its best. And again, me writing an email, uh, so you know I'm friendly and excited, but now I'm using a period so that you know I'm not crazy. And here's another sentence. So yes, you have to use it in moderation. That's the key message out here. And um, so use it when you're genuinely excited about something, but lose it when you are excited about everything. Because then um, your mails and your posts will be read as such. So uh, there is a certain social media or, or online personality that you're trying to convey to the person at the other side, on the other side. So you have to be very careful in what you convey. And also use it when you need to lighten the mood, but lose it when you're being stern. And use it once, but never more than that, generally, but it's not an absolute rule. And uh, yes, now we also have the blue exclamation mark coming up these days where uh, Twitter explains that these are on potentially misleading content. So this is one exclamation mark you don't want to see on your social media platforms. And uh, Indeed, as Dr. Gasparian said, exclamation points affect your tweets, retweets, and clicks. So it's very interesting to note how these things work um, in terms of um, affecting the human psyche. So if something exciting, it gets more retweets, but fewer clicks. So people don't read it, they just retweet. And that's part of the reason why Twitter made it harder to retweet before the American election. And uh, for academicians, use in moderation is what I will advocate. And again, the other thing is referring to literature. So you may like to uh, refer to something which is published and we went through a lot of tweets. So either put in the link or use the at button to tag or mention the authors wherever possible. If you can then mention the journal at least, uh, most of the journals are present on social media platforms and it increases the visibility and dissemination, especially if they were to retweet it. So hopefully today we have moved from where bad grammar affects you to a good effect um, on the reader. And uh, another thing, which sometimes just a brief word about figures and tables, where you need to use capital F and T, and you may use abbreviation of figures, but use a dot here uh, or a dot after F-I-G-S, but tables are not abbreviated. It's something which sometimes you may um, find yourself mistaken about and be concise when introducing or referring to a figure or table. Wherever possible, avoid passive forms. So the F and T are in capital, but if there is no number after it, then it may be in small letters. Like figure one, table two, fig one A, figs two A, two B. And for details, see this, as can be seen in the figure below. So here, there is no number and it is in small letters. So um, this is not an advertisement for Twitter, but still I would advocate it for uh, as a tool for language learning, particularly because of brevity, it's short form, everybody's out there. So if you want to follow any of the um, grammar editing services, if you want to, want to follow any of the teachers, you want to follow any of the native English speakers, you want to follow the journals, so all of them, nature, science, everybody's out there and you get all kinds of information. You want it and you have it right there. And it's multimedia, so you can watch videos, you can watch, you can read blog posts, 
you can listen to podcasts and of course you can read the tweets the content of the tweets so what are the strategies that you should try out immediately for high flying language learning skills follow all the right accounts and um, the accounts of native speakers uh, related to language learning hobbies hobbies are very important if you follow football if you follow dance if you follow cricket anything then you should try to follow them because that will interest you and you will make special effort to read and understand what's written and humor of course is is uh, the key in life so uh, it's always good to follow some witty and humorous account and try to interpret what they say and um, there is a tool known as advanced search on Twitter. So if you can go in there in the settings, then written in any language and you can choose English there to specifically see and um, post in English and utilize it to the full potential, change the language settings. Also, sometimes people try to Google the hashtags which are um, trending and then you search those hashtags on Twitter. So what happens is the native speakers of uh, that language which you chose and the top speakers or the top uh, and the people who are posting regularly and have the top posts will come up and then you can follow those accounts and they're likely to have good language skills. So this is one of the things, the hacks that I discovered myself while preparing this talk today. And then mind the tweets for language lessons. And uh, you can read the tweet aloud because it sounds different. You also learn better when you recite and figure out what the tweet means, make an effort, Google about it, use translate tool, but don't have the translate tool um, incorporated into Twitter. Use it separately, study grammar, study the sentence construction, follow dialogues. If there's an interesting talk, try to get into it, try to comment, try to read, try to make sense yourself. And that is how you learn and grow. And uh, commit to tweeting at least three times a day. So that is the most important part. And these are some of the great accounts which I will recommend you to follow. I myself conducted a search and found these great and I'm following some of these. So English learner has some great humor, um, like flammable versus inflammable, which <laughs> inflammable, don't worry, no, you should worry. And there's a Spanish teacher who posts a lot of idioms and phrases for you to learn. And these are some hashtags, which again are checked out and some of them are really great. So if you're targeting um, English, proficiency in English, then maybe you should try out these. And just to give you a sneak peek into what Grammarly has to offer, it's a great account on Twitter and they have some material how to start an email empathetically during difficult times. I found this really interesting because hope this email finds you well has been overused until it's, uh, and I think it's death date maybe near. So it has a lot of innovative options instead. Oxford language, describes um, some of the new words that have uh, crept into our dictionary like circuit breaker and uh, unprecedented um, global pandemic. It describes the use of the word lockdown, which was surprisingly only in UK, Canada and Australia, but in US they call it shelter in place. And in Singapore, they call it circuit breaker. And in Philippines and Malaysia, they have different terms. So this is how language works and evolves. And the Cambridge YouTube channel, oh, they had a, an amazing video, which um, maybe you can have a quick look at how to politely exit a conversation. So here is George and someone is trying to talk to him. He doesn't want to talk. Max is a nice guy, but he does waffle a lot. Hey, and I'm a busy man. How can I exit the conversation without being rude? Did I tell you about my cat's birthday last week? Uh, bye, Max. What do you mean? I'm leaving this conversation. Tell me you don't mean that. This would so be we... nice chatting to you, Max, but I've really got to get back to work. Oh, OK. Yeah, uh, see you later. Yeah, speak soon. Bye. So that was one way of saying it, and oh, oh okay, yeah, I, I should actually get going now. Okay, yeah. all right, sorry. Speak to you soon. Yeah. Another right. way of right. saying it. If you're it. trying to exit a conversation in the street, you can apologize first and then explain that you urgently need to be somewhere else. For example, I'm really sorry, but I've got to run. In this sentence, we push "got to" together to make "gotta." I'm really sorry, but I've got to run. Or you can say, 
I'm really sorry, but I should probably get going. Should probably in the sentence makes it sound like you don't want to leave the conversation, but you have to. So I'll let you watch the complete video yourself, but yes, it's great and highly recommended. In fact, going through all this today, I myself felt motivated to learn one of the languages I've been aspiring to learn for quite some time. And on that note, yes, that's Spanish. Hola, amigos, and adios, amigos. So this is the book I use today. Thanks to Dr. Kasparian and his suggestion. This is a wonderful book, and I suggest all of you to go through it at leisure. Just, just leisure reading, not no stress, a lot of examples, and maybe go over it a few times. And gradually, this thing will subconsciously, you can absorb it into your language. And Facebook also has a lot of learning uh, material and resource online. There's the translate tools and the language support groups. So if you're more active on Facebook, you can go check them out. And there are also other books in this series, um, more material for you. But yes, interactive learning is the best. So yeah, Twitter should be your go-to probably. And on this note, I'd like to close today and thank um, everyone, all my mentors um, who have helped me reach where I am today. And it's a continuous learning process. We learn from our teachers and last but not, in, not least in any way um, are our students. Uh, with whom we continue to collaborate, learn, and grow each day. So never give up and keep learning. Dear, dear Latika, uh, many uh, thanks. Uh, thanks to your impressive and eye-catching uh, presentation. We all understood uh, that Twitter is not only a great way for science communication, but also a great way for improving uh, our language skills. Uh, and uh, our message to all participants, if you don't have Twitter account, uh, please open <laughs> personal Twitter account. Uh, thank you very much. It was uh, excellent, Latika. <laughs> thank you. And we yes. have uh, one question, uh, one comment from, uh, uh, from our participants, uh, from, uh, like one moment, uh, from Victor, uh, very informative, thank you. <laughs> Who is that, Victor? Um, Victor uh, is, uh, one moment. Uh, from which city? Uh, from Kiev, if I correctly remember. Um, one moment. Okay, I just have a quick question to uh, Latika. Latika, thank you very much for really impressive, elegant presentation. It's authentic. Uh, I've never seen this type of presentation on social media and English. So my understanding is that uh, all non-Anglophone authors may benefit uh, from uh, Twitter services because it's easy. You simply uh, write qu uh, short qu uh, sentences and you may also use graphics. So graphical information is important for uh, non-Anglophone scholarly ac activities because of their uh, some problems with language. So uh, what is your message again to our webinar participants, how they can benefit from Twitter activities? So firstly, they should follow the right account. Some of them were suggested in today's presentation and they should try to uh, follow a lot of native English speakers. Like if you are a rheumatologist or a cardiologist or you are a historian or a linguist, you should follow the personalities in your field who are from Britain or America and who are popular on social media platforms, who have a lot of followers. So they are the influencers and they're very particular about their tweets and comments. So you see how they craft it. Because in language, it's not just the grammar, it is also the emotion, because the emotion is going to convey and get you in the stride, you know, take you take you along on that journey. So see how they framed it and try to try to translate it and try to write it yourself in English and then compare how you would have said it or how they would have said it. If it's a paper they've shared, just read it and try to compile your sentence and compare it with them. And it's a slow process and try to come in, try to interact. And of course, there's a lot of interactive groups also on Twitter. You can follow certain hashtags and just participate in online learning just through comments and interaction, which can be great. And I'll recommend okay. you to start doing that. Okay, thank you very much. Some of our Ukrainian participants are active on Twitter. 
and uh, they may also uh, use it for their research activities as well. Let's say for survey uh, studies. So uh, first step at uh, conducting towards conducting surveys is to establish network on Twitter, on social media, and then send questionnaires directly to target groups that uh, would make research easier. So today's participants, mostly medics, may also start using Twitter to be more active scholarly, to take part in surveys and run their own surveys. So Twitter activity, useful for language, for learning English, but it's also useful for scholarly activities. And for scholarly activities, in my opinion, they should also use uh, proper English. So without mistakes, without pun uh, even without language and punctuation mistakes, and without, of course, uh, abundant use of exclamation marks. Of course, we may put some emojis, some exclamation marks, but uh, abusing uh, these uh, language tools also unacceptable. And one of the rude and totally unacceptable practice and when social media users cap capitalize their texts, it, it irritates and it's completely unacceptable. So some non-anglophone non users do not understand why anglophone users are irritated when they see capital letters so again something related to emotion again, because it sounded a shouting <laughs> something <laughs> like shouting, shouting. Yeah. Uh, well and uh, one more comment and question uh, from victor who represents national academy of science uh, of ukraine uh, twitter is cool uh, but do you consider facebook outmoded so uh, no, I would definitely not say that. It's just a personal preference. In India, we use more of Facebook for personal uh, interactions. And uh, so I have a lot of people on my Facebook and a lot of them are not medics and friends. It's just a personal preference. I think in uh, Ukraine, more uh, you use more of Facebook for academic engagement and I don't even check Facebook. The other thing which uh, needs to be considered is like every social media platform has its own lifespan, you know, like there was Orkut so many years back and it got phased out. And now Facebook has moved on to Instagram and has bought WhatsApp. So we don't know what the future of uh, this thing is. Obviously Facebook is continuously revamping and there's a lot of things which are coming up. There are groups, there's a marketplace, there are videos, there are pages. So it's constantly upgrading and in that battle to survive. But yes, it's been around for quite a bit. So I don't know, I'm not a technical expert, but it is possible that, you know, we may see its demise at some point and there may be other platforms which may take up. But for now, I think Facebook is good enough, but you need to be uh, in a place where the rest of your community is. So depending on what your speciality is and what your stream is, if the other experts are using Facebook for that purpose, because in the US and UK, people don't use much of Facebook, not even for personal interactions. So we would not want to always be on those platforms where we don't find our peers because peer learning and feedback is a very important component of mutual growth and collaboration. Uh, yes, and so uh, a Twitter activity you. also influence uh, automatic uh, score. <laughs> yes, so yeah, Twitter I think is a higher weighted as Olina says probably and uh, than Facebook, so that is one of the other things. You are both right. So, but uh, Facebook, uh, is important in some countries. You probably know that Egyptian rheumatologists are active on Facebook compared to, let's say, Turkish rheumatologists who are active on Instagram. So I know that you uh, wrote, you, Latika, an excellent opinion piece on uh, social media differences uh, related to country preferences and cultural dif differences. So. I would recommend uh, to our audience to read that uh, publication on social media across the world, across some countries. So, and of course, I know that Facebook is also a rich platform for uh, learning English. I frequently share some posts, fa Facebook mentions, and uh, even posts on uh, Vitalina Tishinka's profile. So, 
sorry about that, but uh, I I think that it 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 also it's a sort of game, networking trick, but it it helps with uh, with uh, Twitter. Twitter is more serious, more uh, academic platform, and these type of tricks are not common on Twitter. Twitter is type two fun, so it takes time. I never liked Twitter. I was an Instagram person, but it takes time. And once you, so just I'll suggest just read whatever you read today. You post there, and mm -hmm. when you start sharing, it takes time. Just post four to five times a day, and your friends will read, and then you will start enjoying it because you will start seeing the feed which you are interested in. It takes some time to build up. So there were mm -hmm. years when I never used Twitter and never enjoyed it, but now I'm enjoying it. So uh, give it some time and just post for your friends to read whatever you're reading and I think it'll come up. Thank you very much, uh, Gupta. So uh, Dr. Gupta, so your message is important for all uh, Eastern European uh, participants who may also use social media for their journals. Uh, let's say Vitalina is our next speaker who may also use some uh, social media channels to promote her own journals in Krivi Ri and attract followers. So, Olina, introduce <laughs> our next speaker. Thank you very uh, much. It's a, big, it's a big honor and pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Vitalina Tishenko, who is a linguist, translator, and uh, an, an editor of Krivarich uh, National University uh, Journals. Uh, Vitalina, please. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. I'm so happy to share this time together with you, as well as exchange our experience to each other. Thank you for your sweet greeting today. What happened? Uh, everything is okay. You can continue. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you so much. So I, I want to share my demonstration. Mm -hmm. Okay, Alena. Everything uh, is fine. We can see your presentation. Thank okay. you. Okay, so good. So, my dear friends, uh, today I uh, go through quality basics of English grammar for scholarly purpose uh, to improve our academic writing. I'd like to focus more on common errors made by known uh, native speakers of English and illustrate with examples how to correctly use grammar rules directly in journal papers. So we see, we know, we see that poor language is one of the reasons of publication rejection. It's uh, important for us to craft a well-written manuscript and easy to understand, accurate and effective language. So, um, I would like uh, to focus on three uh, sections. The first one uh, is devoted to article usage, indefinite, definite, and zero article, as well as the second one quantifier, some, any, little, a few, a few, much, many, and the third one relatives, relative pronouns, who, which, that, and whose. So, uh, English articles usually mystify non-speaker uh, of English, even so this theme is widely taught. Uh, the, uh, first we begin with article usage in definite article and definite the and zero article. Let me just remind you that English article can be indefinite uh, and an or definite. So indefinite article uh, we use for non-specific or non-particular nouns in singular uh, while a definite article there we use for specific or particular nouns in singular and plural form. So authors who are not comfortable with English very often as they use uh, indefinite article incorrectly. I would like to precise uh, some situations when we use indefinite article a uh, and n. So very easy the first section here uh, when it's uh, before consonant when noun start with consonants for example p, p, n, we use indefinite article a. Uh. 
for example, a Sony laptop, Vodafone application, and let's compare with um, non rich uh, Star Trail with Huawei, an Apple laptop. A very tricky situation with the letter U, if U sounds like U University, for example, yeah, we uh, can hear this uh, certain consonant Y universal, then we use um, indefinite article A. If a uh, letter U sounds like A, for example, understand uh, in such um, words uh, undisputed, um, uh, so for example, undisputed argument, uh, undiscussable question, we use indefinite article N. Uh, as well as before H, uh, when it sounds like H, like consonants, and we, we call normal rules, for example, a Huawei phone. So when we have a silent H uh, in words, our honesty, uh, then we use indefinite N, N hour. Uh, sometimes um, letter H can sound like in alphabet H, NHP computer, for example. Uh, so, Mm, also use difference between usage and definite article R and N in acronyms, digits, and symbol. Uh, if you have word or uh, sound combination, uh, pay attention, it's not acronyms, EU, for example, European project, yeah? So then we use article indefinite N. When it's about acronyms, pay attention that EU capitalized, and then we uh, use N, any U project. So sometimes the acronyms uh, can be read as words, then we use A, indefinite article A, for example, a NATO officer, a PIN code. Sometimes the acronyms, they can be read by a letter, for example, a URL, a URL, an NLP course. Uh, pay attention before letters in acronyms. For example, the following um, B, C, D, G, K, P, Q, T, U, V, W, Y, Z, um, as an example, a US soldier, a VIP person. And let's compare with um, letters so which we can with A, E, F, H, I, M, N, O, R, S, X. Then we have indefinite article, for example, an ATM, ATM machine, an X-ray, an SOS signal. When you decide in between, uh, between indefinite article R and N uh, in um, uh, words uh, that are uh, expressed by figures, for example, one gigabyte, uh, 100 kilobytes, so how to, how not to mistake here, then just say out the word in your head. So a one gigabyte disk, a 100 kilowatt potter, battery. So uh, when it's about um, in figures, so we start with uh, power, just follow normal rules. An eight gigabyte disk and 11 kilowatt battery. As well as before symbols and Greek letters, uh, so in spite of being, uh, being expressed by symbol or word, uh, just use the indefinite article, a hash, a percentage, or an epsilon, I can, I can see in my presentation, or an aesthetics. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so my practical recommendation for you to avoid any abbreviation and acronyms. Uh, especially, especially in the abstract and conclusion. Avoid abbreviation in acronyms, except for well-known ones. Avoid acronyms as replacement for citation. It's very important to use uh, to use articles and to know uh, their. Uh, accurate uh, usage. So let's talk about definite articles then, and we have a different situations when we use exactly definite articles then. Uh, 
So with countable nouns in the singular and plural and uncountable nouns in the meaning mentioned earlier. So as an example, a flatbed scanner is similar to a photocopier. Once the scanner is activated, it reads images as a series of dots. So the second sentence, uh, we uh, have the meaning as mentioned earlier, the scanner. And so called um, of phrases, as an example, the preliminary results of the investigation are promising. The existence of test function is not evident. So the next situation, in generalization with singular countable nouns to refer to a class of things. So you can see the example, sorry, because I can't see. Uh, mm -hmm. As well as with superlative degrees of adjectives uh, and ordinal numerals, as an example, the best results were obtained during the second experiment, experiment with specifiers, same, only, chief, and so on. So let's have an example. The only paper on this problem was published 10 years ago with the name of unique object. And we can see the classic example, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, as well with the names of series, effects, and devices modified by proper name used as an adjective. For example, the Celsius scale. But when a proper name is used in possessive form, uh, pay attention that no article is used. For example, Einstein's theory of relativity, Taylor's formula. Uh, when we use as a definite article uh, with a decade, for example, the 1980s. Mm -hmm. So let's have, uh, let's have some differences between usage in definite article uh, and an versus them. Use an and for the first time when you mention something and use the if reader knows what you are talking about. Let's compare it in our examples. So this paper presents a new system for modeling 4D maps and uh, actually the same sentence here, but uh, how we use articles there. This paper presents a new system for modeling 4D maps, the system based, based on. I don't have a computer at home. Let's compare. I have a computer at home and at work. The computer that I have in my office is a Mac and the one at home is an HP. So a use indefinite article to refer to something generic. For example, a comparison of our data with those in the literature indicates that. Let's compare with the, uh, with the example uh, when we make general statements about some entity. Yeah? The comparison given in section 2.1 highlights that. So use uh, also indefinite article uh, and in definitions and that to me general statements. A computer is an electronic device for storing and processing data. So let's have definition and compare the computer has changed the way we live. Uh, one of the most interesting situation when we use indefinite article and before external organs. For example, a bird is a growth of hair on the face of an adult male. So let's compare uh, with the second example when we use definite articles there before internal organs. For example, the heart is the most important muscle of the human body. Zero articles. This term refers to cases where no article is required at all. So use as a zero article if you are talking about something in general and the noun is. In plural, for example, Oracle don't sell computers. Oracle is American company, uh, don't sell computers. 
So when the noun is uncountable, like hardware information research, for example, the same American company Oracle sell software. Research is essential if progress is to be made. Uh, when noun is abstract also, for example, there was a significant effect road conditions on speed. Uh -huh. Note that <clears throat> some words change meaning if they are used with the, with article the. For example, I love nature and compare with the following examples, the nature of this problem is not clear. When titles to, um, to papers occasionally omit the article of the first noun, let's compare these titles. For example, development and validation of a test to measure competence in English. So absolutely okay when we omit the definite article in the title to paper, the development of a validation of a group testing of logical thinking. Note that caption to figures often omit the definite articles. For example, figure one, average rainfall 20, uh, 10, 2020. So when we have no definite articles there in the captions to figures, we predicted the average rainfall for 2020. Let's have differences in usage, zero article versus an. And sometimes uh, this usage can be contradictory in scientific English. So the second column in the table below list some occasions where the informal rules uh, of the use of articles in English apparently been broken, but such occurrences are nevertheless frequently found in research papers written by native speakers. Let's compare normal accepted usage and analysis. All the data showed that, and also possible in science when we emit. Um, article or when we use zero article, your yeah? analysis of the data showed that. So the following example, a further analysis of the data showed that. Further analysis of the data showed that. Normal accepted also usage a statistical analysis of the data showed that and statistical analysis of the data showed. So, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, our second section. So I, I would like to highlight our sec second section about quantifiers. Actually, I would like to discuss on definitions, types and examples of quantifiers in English grammar and pay attention. So as uh, the name says, quantifiers are meant uh, the words which inform us about amount or quantity of something, particularly noun. So the most uh, popular quantifiers in English language are some, any, little, a little, few, a few, much, many, a lot of. So, <sighs> okay. let's divide all quantifiers uh, into two groups. Those quantifiers which uh, can be used with um, countable nouns and uncountable nouns. So let me precise that countable nouns are individual people, animals, places, things, uh, or ideas which can be counted. Uh, as usually we uh, use the questions to them, how many, for example, project projects here, we can uh, even make of the plural forms, image to images, and, to, and we uh, also use irregular nouns, person, people, child, children, and fish, fish. Okay, uncountable, uncountable words or nouns, and those um, uh, that um, we can't uh, count, actually, they're objects, you yeah, just uh, we can ask the questions, how much? So actually uh, we use some, any, little, a little, much, a lot of. So how we use 
quantifiers. Mm -hmm. To begin with some any, when we want to refer to a plural noun or an countable noun without carrying a specific quantity, we use some and any. Some classical rule, uh, we use some in affirmatives, for example, this gave some interesting results. Um, in questions and negative uh, sentences, we use any. For example, this didn't give any interesting results. Did it give any results? I can ignore the exception. Uh, for example, would you like some chocolate? Or can I have some water? Uh, actually, it's not a question, it's a request or offer. Uh, take attention, any versus some. We use in some construction. So when we have not any, the context means zero. Let's have this example. In example, we were not able to understand any of the figures. They were all too complicated and unclear. So actually, we understood nothing because not any means zero. The second, to compare example, we were not able to fulfill some of the reference requests, especially the first and the last request. So in construction, not some, uh, we see that actually not all, but something we fulfill. Any is used to indicate doubt. We are not sure whether the event will take place or not. So let's compare. If you need any clarification, then don't hesitate to contact me. Actually, we don't know if you really uh, need my clarification. So some, I need some clarifications with regard to point three and eight. When we use any versus no, pay attention. The first situation, no one is preferred to not anyone in research papers. For example, to the best of our knowledge, no one has found similar results to this. Uh, we can't use no way. In the following sentence, to the best of our knowledge, there isn't anyone who has found. Result and hardly require any rather than not. Let's have an example. You can do this without any problems or at least with hardly any problems. So we can't use, and the second example, you can do this without no problems or at least with hardly no problems. A little a few, we see little few. Actually, a little, a little, it is not the same. Uh, let's have some examples and clarification. A little, we use uncountable nouns and little uncountable nouns too, but we have some distinguished differences, yeah? Let's compare. Now we have a little time left, so does anyone else have any questions? So a little time. Actually, we can replace by some or not much, but enough. Uh, as we see, it's a positive context. Little is known about the very rare disease. Almost nothing is known. So context is negative. According to a few, few. So a few plural nouns indicate a limited quantity. Let's have an example comparison with few. We have a few more experiments to do, five or six, I think, and then we have finished. Okay, and few researchers have investigated this complex phenomena. So maybe only two or three researchers. Some quantifiers, much, many, a lot of, and lots of. Much is used with uncountable nouns and many with plural nouns. For example, uh, we can use much for uncountable. There is not much information on this topic and we can't use it with many. We don't have many information, so it's wrong. Pay attention. We have not uh, made much progress 
And let's compare, we have not made many progress. So it's impossible yet to use many with progress because progress is uncountable. There have been many advances in this technology, so it's normal. According to a lot of, so we have a lot of data, let's have this example, and uh, a lot of uh, some authors actually avoid uh, a lot of or lots of because still uh, think that it is sufficiently uh, informal. A lot of is replaced, but not much or not many in negative phrases. For example, there are not many accessible papers on this subject. There are not a lot of accessible papers on these subjects. But remember, <clears throat> you should be specific uh, when using quantifiers because quantifiers are appropriate when they have been defined with a numerical value. So let's compare you with uh, such uh, examples. For example, rates increase a lot when we use quantifier a lot. So uh, it uh, will be much better rates tables and uh, just use it with full sentence. The rate doubles for every increase um, in 10 Celsius degree, which is significant. Mm -hmm. So, and our third section, relative pronouns, who, which, that and who. So how do I use relative clauses? Actually, Armin has already mentioned about here. I would like to add some information in some detail. I think that Kema is never much. So let's help. I would like to begin with my example. Uh, it is not scientific, but uh, it's easy to understand. I met a student. The student is 25 years old. Mm -hmm. And I would like to make up one sentence. I met a student who is 25 years old. As you see, I connect two pieces of information into one sentence and I use relative pronoun who because a student here yeah, and we uh, would like to define this noun uh, given more information. So. We use relative pronouns for relative clauses to give additional information about something or somebody to make your text more fluent and to avoid repeating certain words. Relative pronouns, they are associated who or whom with people, which that with things, and whose plus noun it is possession. Let's have the following example. And I would like to precise at once uh, the common ear. So I met a student who is 25 years old. I would like to repeat this, this example. She wrote a document which that is five pages long. Mm, don't uh, do the second year uh, example. I met a student 25 years old. She wrote a document uh, five pages long, it's wrong. So we have to define uh, our nouns through relative pronoun, who when it's about student here in this example and which or that when it's about things like a document. For example, uh, uh, the following example, I will demonstrate uh, the contraction, which is also the common ear. Uh, professor Shiro, whose seminal paper was published in 1996, is a professor, yeah? So uh, never, never mix uh, of this construction, yeah? Professor Shiro, whose seminal paper was published because whose, uh, it is uh, the contraction of who, is or who has. So in this example, we demonstrate that whose is a possessive pronoun. After preposition, he use which when it's about things and whom when it's about people. So note the word order. For example, I have several mobile phones, many of which do not work. Uh, and compare with the following example, I have several mobile phones, many of that don't work. So we can't, uh, we can't use 
that in this case, only which after preposition. There's a second, this institute employs many people, most of whom are technicians, most of whom, no way, most of who, because it's um, people uh, and um, many people as object in this example. Some relative clauses identify persons or things. So identify or define and such kind of clauses we called identifying clauses. Let's have an example. Here are some cells which have been affected. So as you can see, which we use uh, for define cells and it's actually things. There are the people who want to buy our house we define the people uh, through relative, through relative uh, pronoun. So we have relative clauses. Which main fe features are the relative clauses? Uh, first, uh, we, I, you, we use, we add essential information to define the follow as a preceding noun. Uh, we don't use comma and uh, we can actually use that instead of which, who, or whom. So mostly it is used in informal speaking. So for example, uh, here are some cells that have been affected. There are the people that want to buy our house. Uh, let's have non-identifying clauses. For example, her car which was very old, broke down after just five miles. As you can see, uh, we have identified relative clause in the sentence. And actually, as this extra information, we don't need it. And to pay attention that uh, this non-identifying clause go between commas. And in this case, we can't use that. Uh, instead of which, who, or whom, who. So uh, let's have this example, how not to do her car that was very old broken, broke down after just five miles. And there are some cases when we can omit a relative pronoun who, which, and that. So pay attention, who and which can be omitted when. Attributes, ages, job position, and figure tables, and so on are mentioned. As an example, Professor Shirov, who is age 52, who was born in 1980, an expert on Mars. Actually, we can omit enough. Aged 52, born in 1980, an expert on Mars. When we have construction, which class to have? Um, actually, we replace this construction by with. As an example, a tiger is a large, fierce animal found in Asia, which has striped yellow and black skin. Let's compare. A tiger is a large, fierce animal found in Asia with striped yellow and black skin. So we omit uh, which or who uh, just to avoid this repetition in very short space. For example, Professor Shiro, who is in mid professor, who was awarded the Nobel Prizes. As you can see, they follow very, very short space. As we already mentioned, relative clauses are used in definition. So just have an example. Psychology is a branch of science which studies the mind and its process. Psychoanalysis is a method of healing mental illness that traces them through interviews to the events in the patient's early life, bringing those events to his her conclusion. Identifying clauses actually we can reduce in the following cases. When it is a structure, who plus to be, for example, an equinaut is any person who is trained to live for a long period in the sea to study marine life. Let's compare how we can reduce. An equinaut is a person trained to live for a long period in the sea to study marine life. When we have construction, uh, which plus to be, for example, a star is any of bodies which are seen in the sky at night as distant points of light. 
and reduced form. A star is any of the bodies seen in the sky at night as distant points of light, as well as the construction that plus to be. For example, a tooth is each of the hard white bone like structures that are rooted in cones. A tooth is each of the hard white bone like structure rooted in cones. So, but remember, if you are in doubt to reduce or not to reduce uh, the following cases, so the simplest solution is not to uh, never omit that which and whom. So, and finally, and finally, I would like to say that <laughs> never, never give up if you believe in your work. So happy writing and wish you good luck in writing academic papers. Vitalina, thank you very much. Very informative, instructive, and uh, a sort of didactic presentation for all our present uh, participants. I'm not sure that uh, our mentors, from particularly from Chicago, need such a didactic presentation because they they are native uh, English speakers. But most of our Eastern European Bulgarian participants should watch this video, this part, and uh, advance their writing skills. I would also encourage uh, fellows from your own city to actively involve you in English teaching because without English, without academic English, uh, your research fellows, your faculty members cannot publish good papers. Even if they are professors, members of academies, they need to know uh, English, academic. Uh, they should be fluent, not just in spoken English, but also in written English. And your tips, your uh, instructions, how to, let's say, how to reduce or uh, cut some redundant words, let's say that uh, often uh, is a redundant word and uh, clauses can survive without or can be reduced uh, without that which, who and whom. So these type of tricks, like linguistic tricks are important for uh, research fellows and journal editors. Unfortunately, uh, Eastern European journal editors uh, stubbornly continue uh, avoiding English articles, English editing, and this is why most journals in Eastern Europe are not covered by Scopus and particularly Web of Science. Web of Science pays uh, too much attention to language issues, and if and a journal from your city, other Ukrainian cities are going to apply to Web of Science, which is a US-based agency. They need to um, hire language editor like you or translator and uh, improve language of their uh, non-English speaking authors. So your presentation is very instructive and I hope you will uh, take part uh, in our future webinars with new information, how to improve uh, academic writing skills. Thank you very much. And I wish you good health, happiness, and also uh, reaching new highs in your academic career. Thank you very much. Uh, Vitalina, uh, thank you very much. It's really a great job. Uh, your presentation was excellent, very informative. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. It's me, Huma. Thank you, and really, with my pleasure, I did it. In hope for our future cooperation. So, I okay. hope to be useful for you all. Thank you so much. You've been very useful, and I am sure we'll maintain, uh, we'll continue planning new lectures, new new presentation. At at some point, we may also consider a separate linguistic course with you as a as a as the, the only speaker. Thank the you very only. much, Italina. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, it uh, seems 
Uh, like we have discussed uh, all uh, main items of today's meeting, uh, who would like to add something, uh, some questions, uh, comments, uh, please? So uh, we, need, we need some feedback. And I think that Salomia, who is also a linguist from Lviv, could also share her thoughts how this, this type of presentation can be useful, Salomia. Uh, yes, here I am. Uh, thank you very much for sharing with me uh, uh, such, infor uh, such an important information. Uh, what uh, was useful for me really, it was that uh, at the very beginning, uh, the, uh, uh, the speaker has uh, uh, numerated or has counted the list of journals such as na uh, Nature, The Lancet, The Science, etc. Um, the um, pertinent to the question, uh, uh, where uh, very important the examples from Scopus articles and ex examples of the mistakes uh, of uh, um, the Professor Durha, yes, um, of the Dr. Durha. Um, especially useful was the phrase, uh, such a phrase as, as this is the first study uh, or something like this. It is, it's not good to use in the uh, Scopus article. Um, uh, I also uh, liked and would uh, use the uh, such uh, um, sites as Grammarly and the others mentioned by the speakers. Um, uh, helpful for me, helpful where the uh, tips uh, <laughs> where to who to learn from, especially uh, mentioned by Professor Durha, that if you want to write a, a Scopus article, you have to, first of all to talk it over with the um, professionals, with people who have who have written a lot, and to uh, ask many questions and to discuss it. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Solomia. I got your point. So, Dr. Durga is a, uh, is, a is an Indian uh, editor, and he writes uh, articles in pure English. And I am one of his co-authors. Uh, we benefit a lot. Uh, from each other, from our cooperation and co-authorship. And I think that his point about uh, request of most reviewers, when they see uh, broken language or when they see poorly understandable language, reviewers simply add, please uh, ask a native English speaking expert uh, to revise, to edit. That's politically and uh, culturally inappropriate. It's better to ask simply to uh, authors to pay more attention to English without asking them to refer to native English speaking experts. Not all native English speaking experts are good at uh, academic English or not good at copy editing, substantive editing. So his point, I got that point from his uh, presentation, which is uh, quite understandable. And thank you, Solomia, for pointing to other important uh, tips of our presenters. Thank you for being with us. Uh, hopefully you will also join and share your uh, knowledge uh, with our participants about in, uh, written uh, or academic English. We need that support. And my personal opinion is that we need English to all of us. We need to be, uh, to improve, upgrade our English skills, uh, academic English skills to be uh, better researchers. Without English, we cannot process bibliographic databases at a <laughs> proper level. We cannot write articles uh, understandable to American and West, other Western uh, editors, journal publishers. So we need to in invest more in our uh, academic English. And thank you, thank, thanks to Vitalina for sharing experience. Uh, and spend, uh, uh, I, I understand that all of you are uh, busy family, busy, busy moms with a lot of family duties, but thank you for sharing 
your generously sharing and spending time with us in this uh, festive season. Thank you very much. To, thank you to all our linguists, uh, participants of today's webinar. And uh, I ask Professor Oksana Zaishkiv to also share her comments, her feedback. Thank you, Arman. Uh, as average, and uh, I'm very happy uh, that this uh, webinar uh, was fabulous because uh, new sites of scientific writing were discussed. So thank you, our um, prominent scientists, uh, Armen Gasparian and our young scientists who join us and deliver a very nice presentation. And for Vitalina, we are very happy to have you in our cycle of uh, Ukrainian scientific editors. And we also have in our journal uh, two English editors is uh, maybe, you know, uh, Professor uh, Sudomora. Yes. Yes, and also young um, uh, editors, Yulia Homage, uh, who is also very well known. And we also, uh, several times invite uh, Dr. Vasil Lunchina, who is a native uh, fluent in English, and it's very help us, especially uh, for me, when we have some several points for discussion, it's very easy to solve. Uh, so I think it's uh, English is really an English uh, pathway as named uh, Durga, Dr. Durga, pathway for scientific communication. And for young people, it's very important except uh, um, small talk English, yes, uh, known uh, about the main points in uh, scientific writings, uh, especially in the scientific uh, articles, papers manuscripts and for me today was very uh, several very uh, important points i like very much um, when present paragraphs in review of papers or in original original papers or about uh, clinical study basic study it's helped to understand and help to structurize it uh, materials and very easy to uh, understand what is the pipeline of this, uh, what is the main message. It's number one. Um, another very important, very interesting for me was several points discussed by uh, Dr. Latika. Uh, it's really um, very well uh, produced messages. Uh, because uh, we're living in the media uh, world, yes, except social media, we have scientific media, it's like special channels for communication, and we should know, uh, for, I, especially about the capitalizing uh, words, yes, it's like you, if you would like to something emphasize, yes, uh, put uh, markers or capitalize, but it's not acceptable in the social media co communication. In the private communication, yes, it's we can use, but it's especially in the social media where it could be discussed from the different point of view, it's un unacceptable. So big respect uh, for all today's uh, lectures, as well for our organizers. Many thanks, Olena, again for you. You do a fabulous work. No one can connect so many people and to have so nice uh, webinars. And for all people who celebrate tomorrow, uh, Merry Christmas uh, by Julian Calendar. So, Merry Christmas, big uh, greetings from me, my family, to your family. Have peaceful, have um, atmosphere, have uh, silent uh, supper uh, together. And buďte zdrovi, buďte bahati. So prosperous uh, 2021 years for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Oksana. Uh, I think that our webinar is really a good uh, start for a new academic year. And we have uh, some positive comments from our participants, from uh, Professor Luncina. Uh, I have to leave for an appointment. Uh, uh, thank you again for this wonderful uh, webinar. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. 
Okay, thank you to all our mentors, to uh, Professor Zajczkiewska, to Professor Vasil Lanchina, uh, who uh, was present for the most part of this webinar. And I, I understand that his main interest is in uh, ethics and uh, medicine, but for all our participants, basics of English grammar are important and they cannot write good articles without knowing, without uh, mastering uh, English grammar. And thank you to our, Vital our keynote speaker, Vitalina, who introduced some of the most difficult parts of English grammar in a nice, in a quite understandable way. They, all our participants and past participants and others should watch that part to learn more basics of English grammar. Think about your next presentation and we should progress with uh, teaching, with uh, instructing our participants and helping them to produce in, uh, articles in readable English. Thank you very much to all our contributors. I know that we have some regular participants from Kharkiv, uh, Yelena Bandarenka. Uh, we have um, also- uh, Some new participants. <laughs> yes, new participants. New one is Sevdalina Lamdova from, uh, uh, from Bulgaria, rheumatologist with a number of publications and I hope that she will also use today's materials to improve her English, written English and target better uh, top rheumatology journals. So thank you, thank you very much. Well, a happy, new, happy new year and Merry always. Christmas to all. Thank you and see you later. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.